So to begin, today is Friday, March the 31st, 2017. My name is Andy Reisinger, and I'm interviewing Becky Greenberg here in the Department of Special Collections and Archives at Georgia State University as part of the Great Speckled Bird Oral History Project. And before beginning, if I can just get your verbal consent to be recorded. You certainly have my verbal consent, and I would like to say that I was Becky Hamilton Greenberg, just for people who see my name in the stat box. The stat box is Becky Hamilton. Okay. So. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, let's start at the very beginning, if you can tell me um, a bit about when and where you were born. Okay, I was definitely a Southerner, born in Birmingham, Alabama in uh, 1945. My father had worked with the war effort, um, but all domestically, because he worked as an engineer. Um, and right after the war, almost immediately after I was born, we moved from Birmingham. They had sort of, uh, my father had sort of overbearing parents, and they decided that they needed to strike out on their own. Mm -hmm. So my father went to work for a small um, propane gas company, and it was down in Florida. It happened to be in, um, actually in very near Orlando, which at that point, if people can imagine, was a small, gorgeous town with many, many lakes, huge live oaks. It was just a beautiful spot in Florida, which is hard to imagine now, mm. Disney World. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we lived on a lake outside of Florida, I mean outside of Orlando, in a place called Gotha. I actually grew up, we were way out in the country at that point. We had a little orange grove and an avocado tree. It was a somewhat idyllic existence. Um, and I did go to this little two-room schoolhouse, it's funny, <laughs> where the first three grades were in one room and the fourth the uh, fourth through six was in another room and it was a delightful experience I mean I love that um, then my father decided instead of working for someone else my mother at that point was bringing up all of us there were five total but not yet I have an older sister and I and I was second and my youngest brother who's nine years younger than I was born in Orlando too, but moved, then we moved, almost, my father decided instead of working for other people, he would rather own small gas companies and small towns, fix them up, and probably then sell them and go on to other things. Mm -hmm. So he bought um, a suburban gas company in a little town called Palatka, Florida which is a little town about 30 miles from St. Augustine, where I live now, in the interior of Florida. Um, very working class town. It's a big industry there was a paper mill, Hudson Paper Mill. And Palatka had a, had a reputation for being a town you wanted to drive through because of the smell mm -hmm. of the paper mill on most days. But that was the big industry there, and actually it was a thriving town with a beautiful, beautiful collection of sort of Victorian houses in decline, because it, it was right on the St. John's River, a lovely place to be that had been a very popular place to stay when the river boats were coming down the St. John's mm. River. And so there were some old, ancient, Victorian hotels, most of them had burned by that time. Um, and Palatka was certainly, well, it was thriving when I was there. I mean, it was a small town, but it was a small working class town. Um, it was known as the Basque capital of the world. I mean, and we were five kids, and my mother and father in a big old house on Emmett Street, if anybody ever watches this, just one block from the St. John's River. And we lucked out in our parents because we had two parents who both were Southerners. Um, they both, they loved each other, but they also loved having five kids. I mean, there were parents who enjoyed their children, um, which was a nice way to grow up. They were very different. My father had been born in Birmingham, Alabama, too, to um, very conservative Methodists, very religious conservatives, conservative Methodists who were also 
decent, hardworking folks, religious. They didn't smoke, they didn't drink, they didn't dance. They were great cooks. They believed in honesty. They didn't have a lot of money, but they also believed in education. So, which Daddy was was um, lucky for that. And he, the Depression happened. They had very little money, so he ended up at Berea College. I don't know if you're familiar with Berea, uh, which is a very remarkable, unusual college. Um, and that's where he went to school and met my mother, who was also from a small town in Kentucky called Pineville, Kentucky, which was not a wealthy town, but her father was an attorney and they felt themselves to be rather elegant people in a small town. <laughs> and mother always, and, and they lived their lives that way. Uh, mother was brought up to, uh, what? She, she dressed elegantly, she lived elegantly. We always had flowers, she was a beautiful cook. She was a, sort of a woman ahead of her time. Uh, she, really disdained going to Berea. Her first year had been at the University of Kentucky, but then when the Depression hit, they just had no money, mm -hmm. lawyer or no lawyer. And so she was sort of forced to go to Berea, which she did with her lips stuck out and unhappy, but came to really value Berea, what it offered then, because it was one of the most progressive schools in I presume the South. Mm -hmm. And if you know about Berea, it's an interesting school because it's a school that charges no tuition. It has boundaries from which the students can come and it's all Appalachian young people who are smart and poor. They have, there's a maximum income and if you make more than that, you cannot come, uh, which is true even still today and they don't ex expect their professors, kids, to come to Berea but you probably make more money. But it's a wonderful place. It was integrated very early. They don't have any tuition, but there's a work requirement. So every student has a job on campus. Um, the Bishop Tutu was there recently. I mean, it's a, a well-known school, at least it was in those days too. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still is respected today. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, my younger brother sort of squeezed into Berea when my parents, will come along later, uh, later, moved to North Carolina, which was in the Appalachian District, and they had retired so they could sort of meet the minimal income, mm -hmm. and he loved it too. So, and I think that had a big influence on their lives because they came in contact with liberal politics, which for, my, which for my father was very important because his father was a complete racist. I mean, I loved him dearly. He was a kind man, it seemed to me, but um, probably had had ties with the Ku Klux Klan. I don't know that for certain, but he was so concerned that I would fly on an airplane and have to see, sit by a black person. And so my father was, even though they were good Christian people, I mean, so, I mean, we could see that contradiction immediately. Uh, and my father talked about that a lot his whole life because he said it was something he, was, he had to struggle against, that being brought up to be a racist and believed that black people were certainly inferior, but Intellectually, he knew that certainly was not true, but it was a struggle for him mm -hmm. to overcome that. And I think we're still tainted with racism. I mean, I struggle, I think we all struggle in some ways, certainly not intellectually, but I'm not sure that's true, of course, but I know what he's talking about. Um, let's see here. They were, now I went to school, I, I graduated from high school in Palatka and really had a very good time in high school. It was an easy place to be a good student and <laughs> because there was a rather low percentage of kids who were going to school, to college, off to college. And we had some excellent teachers in those days. It's funny to think that my very, the, the woman, Mrs. Thomas was her name, 
was the most wonderful English teacher and is probably why I ended up an English teacher myself. Very inspiring person. Um, let's see what else. Mm. Oh, yeah, you know, I always felt very different from people in Palatka because I had that middle class sort of back, I knew where I was, go I knew I was going to college, I didn't know what I was going to be or anything, but our whole family knew we were going to college. And my mother always felt a little, we had very little money, it wasn't a matter of having much money, it was just a matter of a certain idea of what your family, do you know that you're going to do. So, I can remember them arguing, though, especially during the presidential campaign of Goldwater and Johnson, and my father came out on the side of Goldwater, my mother came out on the side of Johnson, and I remember intense fights between the two. They struggled about a lot of things, um, but worked hard at keeping a good marriage going. I think they loved each other. My father was very fun-loving, adventuresome. He had always felt like that he had been brought up to work too hard mm -hmm. and during the Depression. He worked. He said he worked all the summers. He never had much fun, and he wanted to, his kids to have a lot of fun. So fun to him was as important as anything else in life, ambition. Or, so we grew up with that attitude, and it was really a good family to be a part of. Um, let's see. I went off to college. I remember, I only remember my brothers who were nine years younger than I, so they just seemed like little annoyances. I mean, they'll laugh and say I was just so self-obsessed. I don't remember them. But they were sort of the tricksters in the family. We lived in this old house in Palatka that had one and a half bathrooms, and there were seven of us in the house. Mm -hmm. I had an older sister, and a an younger sister, and then two brothers. And so the upstairs bathroom was the one that had the full bath and the shower and everything. And so my brothers would go real early into the bathroom, and we were ready to get in and curl our hair and put our makeup on, lock the door, crawl out the window, and then and just disappear. So we would be beating on the door, trying to get in. It was just, and they're still sort of tricksters. We've all come back together, but they still enjoy those memories as much as anything yeah. else. Um, my father actually, though, was a, he was a, a very accomplished person and very um, part of the establishment of Palatka. He was the president of Rotary Club, for example, and he was the president of the Chamber of Commerce. And so we certainly had that upbringing, too. So not only do you have fun, you're expected to make very good grades, and you're expected to also act correctly. I mean, you don't, you don't, you have a good name to uphold. Mm -hmm. So that was Palatka. Um, and I really had a lot of fun in Palatka. I had good friends, had a lot more money than I did. They all had cars. We all ran, you know, the, the, the uh, hangout in high school was Angels. We'd all go out to Angels after school and drink Cokes. And I mean, I think we were sort of a sheltered kind of, I think we were young a long time compared to when I met what, during this whole period, my parents bought a little beach, it's essentially a beach shack, over in the closest beach, which was Crescent Beach, which is 12 miles from St. Augustine. And so we spent every summer, well, I just spent about four and a half summers there because I was in high school when they bought, in the ninth grade. My older sister had gone away to FSU, but I was in high school, so I was more of a teenager. My brothers really grew up, so they know how to fish, they know how to run boats, they know how to, they know old Florida mm -hmm. in a way that I do not. But those were some, I mean, they're both very magical places, both Crescent Beach, which still exists as old Florida, thanks to the efforts, I think, really, a lot of my brothers, which I'll go into later, just their politics or conservation of old Florida, and my brother's in real estate, but his whole push is to conserve that part of Florida. So we have still have clean rivers. We're in North Florida. Mm -hmm. You know where St. Augustine is. Mm -hmm. So we're in North Florida. We're not 
as bad as South Florida. It's completely concrete by now. But we have uh, oyster leases still that we can get oysters from a very clean Matanzas River. Our family has, uh, well, that comes later, but we own at this point, almost every person in our family has come back to that area. And we all have shacks and houses and we bought a little fish camp there. We all went together because the, fish, the guy who owned the fish camp uh, was dying and it could go for condos, it could be developed, it could go for a huge restaurant. So my brother who's in real estate gathered 10 people together and we all put in money and so we own this little fish camp right in our own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you'll have to come visit sometime. Yeah, it's a great to. place. Um, let's see, I did go off then to Emory. Well, oh. If I can interrupt there mm -hmm. just to, to get a little, little background before this next chapter. Um, what was your specific date of birth in 1945? It was April 14th, okay. 1945. So, birthday coming. Birthday coming, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and there, I, we always celebrate birthdays in a big way. Every chance to celebrate. Another thing I think that was important to me in Palatka was being in the Episcopal Church, which sounds odd because I'm certainly not a churchgoer now. But I found out that there was some, something about the church routine and ritual that I really loved being an Episcopalian. And I actually brought my kids at, up Episcopalian, even though I had sort of quit believing in a lot of that dogma. But it was, um, I feel like in secular society still today, there's no other place that sort of marks the rituals of growing up in a way, except the Episcopal Church did that so nicely. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, and I do miss all that. I would still be, we went to midnight mass for years after we stopped going to the Episcopal Church. And we still, my family still celebrates Christmas. We still go caroling with all the hymns. We don't sing any of the secular songs. We all sing the hymns. It's a tradition to go Christmas caroling and then have potato soup and, and biscuits and all our neighbors go. And it's just something we have never missed a year, mm -hmm. Christmas caroling. And we have many other traditions that are associated with Christmas um, that bring not only us together as a family every year, but all our neighbors, and we have a, a thing called talking up the chimney, where all the kids who still believe in Santa Claus come, and they, uh, and, uh, they come and sit around the, you build a big fire, they come sit around the fire, and they are, there are all these little kids, and they are, you read something to them or talk about Christmas and then uh, lights go off and you tell the kids now, okay, you're going to go around and you're going to tell Santa Claus exactly what you want for Christmas. But you have to close your eyes because it will destroy all the magic because I don't know if Santa Claus will even come if you look or open your eyes. So you go around and each one says, I want to... Barbie doll or something horrible or I want a garden plot or I want a tricycle and they're all and so then you say Santa Claus are you listening nothing happened so then you say oh my gosh somebody says oh somebody had their eyes open obviously so you go around again you say you go around again and they close their eyes and they say Santa Claus are you listening and still there's like usually silence and everybody's getting kind of nervous that maybe there won't be a Christmas this year. And the third time everybody has their eyes closed so tight that when they say, Santa Claus, are you listening? All this candy comes tumbling down the chimney. <laughs> and it's a completely magical. You, I mean, it's there and you get it and it came down the chimney and there is a Santa Claus. I think my kids believed till they were like 14 or something. <laughs> right. But the trick is that, I mean, they used to run outside and see if there was somebody up on the chimney, or which is, for any of the people I know, that's a lot less likely than a Santa Claus being up there. But 
what you do is all the adults stand behind the kids with all this candy and you just throw it over and it's just a miracle because it comes to, comes down the chimney and so there are lots of things that we the family still does together I mean we're a family that stayed close managed to stay close until now yeah. I mean continue to and so and we still love Easter now I'm, I'm married to a Jewish person now, and, and that's hard for him because, you know, Easter is not a pleasant time for the, for the Jews. But he still enters in, and it's mostly, say, I mean, now it's all about Easter baskets and Easter bunnies and things like that. It's, hard, it's sort of the meat of it was taken away. But I think, oh, the other thing we did is we all sang in the choir. So we're all singing. We all know every hymn. and. Lots of church music. Episcopalians know very little about the Bible because they're, they don't, mm-hmm. Jesus was kind of, he was a little uh, pedestrian, I think, for Episcopalians, mm-hmm. or at least for me. I mean, the mystery was what was interesting about religion and mm-hmm. still is to me because, mm-hmm. and once you got, you tried to put God into a man, it just seemed to me it didn't work at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so anyway, that, scene, that was actually a sort of important part of my childhood that I've gone away from, but still miss a lot of the, just the beauty of the, of even the prayer book and all mm-hmm. the hymns and the getting dressed up on Sunday mornings and the youth groups. And so that was in a, a really important part of my life when I was a kid, um, that uh, that took a beating during the years of, I think you know, but I don't know if you know, that Martin Luther King staged one of his big campaigns in St. Augustine, Florida. Did you know that? Mm-mm. It's so funny. It's virtually unknown, although recently there has been, Andrew Young has made a movie about it. Um, yes, he did. He came down in sixty. For St. Augustine was founded in 1565, so it's the oldest European settled town in the United States. It predates all the mass, all the English, because we were settled by the Spanish, mm-hmm. um, and we always get left out, and our feelings are always hurt. But it's because we were Spanish. But so when St. Augustine had its 400th um, celebration. Uh, there was a big outcry on the part of the black community that there were no black African Americans involved in that planning for that because there was a pretty thriving black community in St. Augustine too. Mm. We were close to a, a, one of the beaches. The beaches were even segregated then. But there was a huge beach called Butler Beach very close to Crescent Beach, where we were, in fact, adjoining. And in those days, hundreds of African Americans would come go to the beach, which you don't see anymore. I mean, hundreds would come all over because they could go. And there were there, there were bars and places to eat and they uh, fun. And um, so where was I going with all that? Okay, so um, SCLC here at the invitation of uh, Dr. Haling, who was a dentist in St. Augustine and was becoming very active in the civil rights movement, invited Martin Luther King to come down with the SCLC at that point. Because, and King got interested because it was the 400th anniversary of the oldest town in America, and there was a lot of publicity coming. The King and Queen of Spain, there was a lot of, poured, there was a lot of money poured in. There was one of those plays that was, what was his name, Paul Green? I don't know if you're familiar with those, but he would create sort of historical plays to be put on for certain cities. And one was St. Augustine, and it was from the time of the Indians to the settling of St. Augustine. Uh, And all, all that came about during that 400th anniversary. But King also got interested 
because it was a good time to bring attention to the fact that whites were not included in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so he did. He, he Hosea Williams, Andrew Young, um, oh, and a contingent of northern students, rabbis came from all over. I mean, it was a huge campaign that people are virtually ignorant of. It's changing, but they are now. I mean, they have been. Um, when we first moved back there, Dave, when I was married to David and I moved back there, there was never a mention of it because St. Saint Saint Augustine acted so badly. <laughs> um, people converged on St. Augustine. Martin Luther King set up shop to integrate. What year was this? Okay, this had to be 64. Um, and there was going to be an effort to integrate St. Augustine. Um, the police department was racist. Our sheriff was racist. I mean, it was a typical Southern. North Florida is much more Southern than South Florida, mm -hmm. real Southern. And so it was a racist little town. And um, they got a lot of publicity because of the horrible treatment black people got during those that year in particular. Um, they, and journalists were down too. Uh, every, what happened is the civil, I was away at Emory, but it was back that summer. So I did, was not such a participant as a witness, but it was really a blow to my thinking. Um, the SCLC came and set up shop in the, the part of St. Augustine called Lincolnville, which was where the black community was. And Dr. Haling, who has, who's just like a saint now as, term, as, as far as Florida is concerned, was um, instrumental in sort of leading the local effort. And um, lots of people converged on St. Augustine and integrated the Woolworths which, um, of course, they were dragged off to jail. Um, they had nightly marches around, because of the Spanish town, there's a plaza there, mm -hmm. the churches are around, a nightly marches around the plaza, which the white people would be there, you know, ready to beat them up, and that was all televised. Um, it was the only place that Andrew Young actually got beaten up. <laughs> I think they had. I think Hosea was sent down, and Martin Luther King was pretty. Uh, he was kind of worried about what would occur in St. Augustine because it was a very violent place. Andrew Young called it the most violent place he had been, which is hard to Trump's, you know, uh, Birmingham or. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and Hosea Williams was a wild man, right? <laughs> they had these churches where they'd say, okay, Andrew Young, we're all gathered here tonight and you're going to lead the march. And Andrew Young had always been the person, I think, who sort of hung back, took note of what happened, reported to King. But that night he had to lead the march and he did lead the march and was attacked and one of a, a black person sort of fell on him and protected his body, or he would have been ser very seriously injured. And he came, has come back recently to St. Augustine. Lots of lawyers came down. It was a big, big, big campaign. Um, King was there. It was the only place he was arrested in Florida. The jails got so filled up with protesters that they had to open up one of the st high school stadiums that was just hot as hell uh, to put people in. Um, the governor of Massachusetts, mother, Mrs. Peabody was her name, and she was, was she the governor of Massachusetts, mother? Um, she was also the wife of an Episcopal priest. And she came down and was also arrested. So there were all these people, we were getting all this national news and it was all bad. Mm -hmm. And when the 
when the African Americans tried to integrate the churches, that was the worst part. I mean, <laughs> uh, the Episcopal Church vestry was stood outside and waited for them with clubs. And the minister, the priest, had to go in and call the diocese who said, seat them. So they took them around back and seated them, much to the horror of most of the congregation, um, and later fired the, a very popular minister in town, Mr. Seymour, who came out on the right side of history, thank goodness. Mm. <laughs> But that was a, a hard time in St. Augustine. It was a hard time, but it, it was also sort of a glorious time for the people who did stand up. They're, very, they're being honored so much today. Um, there's a new marker in our plaza dedicated to the heroes of the Civil Rights Movement in St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. Some of the people who, um, who organized and sat in some students there was a black college there called Florida Memorial and one of the students uh, several of the students there were um, juveniles yeah I mean they were in their teens mm -hmm. and so they went to their mother the sheriff went to their mother and said you can either keep them home or we're going to send them off to to reform school and she said I'm not keeping my well you know you can't make me do that I'm not, I'm not keeping my students home from what's happening historically in St. Augustine. And sure enough, those kids got sent away to, to reform school for like, I've forgotten, six months or something. Young, very young people. Mm -hmm. It was a very violent time in St. Augustine mm -hmm. with a lot of the town not looking good. I mean, the leadership of the town was really turned over to the most reactionary forces there. Stoner, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, was, but he was called in and he was from, I think he was one of the John Birch Society people. There were John Birch Society clubs set up in the high schools. I mean, there were, it was a, it was a difficult time for St. Augustine, but also a, a, it was part of history that I know black people and the people who helped them are very proud of. Mm. How, how did your family respond? My family responded, well, my sister at that point was at FSU, and she was also involved in the civil rights there. In fact, we saw her one time on television with the group integrating a swimming pool. Now, she was white, but she was with... So she was involved there. She wasn't involved. My family was... Well, we really didn't live in St. Augustine. We were just there at Crescent Beach for the summer. So we were more onlookers in a way. But... Um, it made my father go back to Palatka and immediately help set a bi up a biracial community there. And Palatka avoided some of that. Um, yeah, it, the hot spot was St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, because it got so much, so much publicity. If you read any of the, of the um, books about that period, St. Augustine is, I mean, they attacked journalists, say, one funny thing was uh, um, a man who owned a big motel right on the bayfront, or right on the Matanzas River and close to the ocean. Uh, blacks tried to, in uh, Dr. King tried to enter, integrate the dining room of that motel and was arrested. And then, so all these rabbis came down, and I, I should have brought their names, but because they've come back lately, these Jewish, yeah, these this group of Jewish rabbis, of course, came down because they they said we're coming. If you call us, we're coming because we know what this kind of thing is about, this persecution. And so they all rented rooms in the Monson Motel. Blacks couldn't, but they could have a guest come swimming. So the rabbis organized this swim in at the Monson Motor Court and invited all these black young people to come. And at a certain time, they all ran and jumped in the pool. A lot of the black people couldn't swim. But anyway, they did. And the owner of the Monson Motor Court, one of the most famous pictures from this whole time, was he took muriatic acid and tried to pour it onto the demonstrators. And so his name was Brock, and he's 
gone down in villainy. I mean, you were either on the right side or the wrong mm -hmm. side of that time. So that's what was happening in St. Augustine in 64 after my first year at Emory, and I had come back just for that summer and come back to Palatka. My family was still there, but had we were spending the time at Crescent Beach. So I, I wasn't really much of a participant, but more a, a an, I was there for a lot of that and saw that and just horror, especially at the my church, the mm -hmm. Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know that any church let them in, although later, much, much later in the past 15 years, there have been several churches that have tried to hold reconciliation services, not that many but probably two or three, um, and that have just been very moving and a good thing to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that happened. Also, can you, can you identify your parents, what their names were? Mm -hmm. My father's name was George William Hamilton, okay, and my mother's name was Margaret Kelly Hamilton. And I know, yeah, very, very different people, but it made a good match somehow. And what was, what was your <clears throat> um, father's family background? You had said that your, his, your mother's family, that her father was a lawyer. His, okay, his father was an accountant. They lived in Birmingham. Okay. In the city. In, in, yes, in the mm -hmm. city, in the downtown part, because it... I guess it was pre-suburban kind of, um, and he. But he was also crippled. He'd been crippled in a bike accident, and it affected his hearing. So I think that probably affected his life in quite a way. But anyway, he was an accountant, and um, my father's mother was a nurse, and during the depression, they had so little money that my mother. My grandmother went away from the family for a while to work as a nurse at some where. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, but we come back on weekends and things. And my father just remembered just having to work so hard, even things like shoveling coal from here to there and selling it. or I mean, really, they had no money. Mm -hmm. um, now, again... Both of those families strongly believed in education, which is lucky. So my father's sister, my Aunt Sally, Sal, went on to, um, to become a medical doctor at Vanderbilt. And in fact, in May, she's being honored. There, there's a big tribute to her as one of the most distinguished alumni of Vanderbilt University. I mean, she did amazing things with developing a vaccine for, for um, meningitis. She she was a pediatrician mm -hmm. there, but she was a pretty amazing woman who lived on into her nineties. And Vanderbilt had often um, honors her, and we're the whole family's going up because mm -hmm. we're so proud, and yeah. we're so proud. Our cousins are still there, so so yeah. And then my father, who was also. <laughs> really smart but just we were so glad we lived in our family though because we had so much more fun than their family who she married this Englishman who enrolled their kids at Oxford when they were born they went off to boarding schools and they lived a rather rigid life and they always loved to come visit us mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm, we're proud of Aunt Sally but we're glad she wasn't our mother yeah yeah <laughs> And how did your your father's family? You mentioned how um, how education was highly, highly valued, mm -hmm. but also that politically or raci racially very reactionary. And your father goes off to Berea, and it all falls apart for him. Everything, all the taboos fall apart. Daddy said once one. I mean, he found out nice people dance. And, you know, he, they didn't work that hard. And they had some fun, and they smoked cigarettes, and they 
drank a little, mm -hmm. and I don't think at Berea you were supposed to drink anyway, but maybe you sneaked off and mm -hmm. drank a little. And um, he was just a, he was a mischievous, fun person. But at that point, I think he really decided to live a very different life from his parents. I mean, he. He did, definitely did, and my mother, I'm sure, played a big part in that because she came from a very Catholic family. They were also very religious, um, and but saw themselves so differently. I mean, they just didn't see themselves as good, hardworking people. They saw themselves who wanted to live a rather elegant lifestyle, mm -hmm. and so a lot of times, mother would take or her mother, my mother's mother, would take her kids, my mother and her brother, just out of school and they'd go down to Miami or something. I mean, just, she didn't care for the conventions so much. And so, she, yeah, there were big differences in their family, I think, and they certainly probably did not condone that marriage. I mean, Catholics were on the list of the Ku Klux Klan cross burnings, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they worship the Pope, for God's sake. Yeah. But Mother was probably much better read than my father. She was more an intellectual, although my father was very smart. It wasn't that. He was just a more practical person, very hardworking. Um, and so they decided not to stay in... The two families were never... I mean, the two elder families were never good friends or in-laws or anything. But the marriage certainly worked. Oh, but it was a problem for them because they were both raised in with religious backgrounds and my father couldn't possibly become a Catholic. He just couldn't. And mother couldn't possibly become a white bread Protestant. I mean, <laughs> at least there was some mysticism in the Catholic Church. Mm. They spoke Latin, so you didn't... Um, and so they compromised on becoming Episcopalians. And they still were different in their approaches. My mother loved the ritual. She loved arranging the flowers on the altar. She loved the intellectual discussion of what is faith and things that go on. But they were both very active in the Episcopal Church till, until they died. Um, my father was much more interested in good works he didn't care at all about how the church looked. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would go, he didn't care. And it wasn't about any, I mean, the ritual was just not not interested. It was your actions, what you did. Mm -hmm. And he actually did a lot in um, St. Augustine. He helped set up the house for homeless people that still exists today. He was one of those founding members. and. I mean, that was his thing, is being involved to do what he thought of as God's work. Mm -hmm. And now none of them were overly, I mean, they weren't evangelist, evangelistic or, I mean, no. And my father certainly wasn't even a big racist or certainly tried not to be. Mm -hmm. He tried not to say those words that he'd been raised with. And he had all of us, too, each one, who made him better. Mm. <laughs> there was no wine or no something to drink or a decent wedding or, I mean, but, uh, but there was not a whole lot. In fact, it, it was funny, later we asked Mother about that because we knew Daddy's family much more than we knew her family, which is odd because... She had a, I guess they lived farther away. Um, and she always felt it was sort of a matriarchy. I remember her talking about that. Uh, and I'm not, I wish I knew more how she felt about that because we did not know her family as well. We did, there, we did go visit and we got, we, there's one aunt that we were, we were very attached to. Her name was Wopi. And my mother's mother um, had severe back problems and I remember her mostly really as a sort of almost an invalid mm -hmm. and you would go visit her in a dark room and so she wasn't a real strong vital person by the time we all came along mm -hmm. and we did not know that family as well as we knew we did go visit our other grandparents 
and they came to visit us, yeah. Okay. And that would be our family vacation. You'd pile seven people in a car and drive in one day from Orlando to Birmingham, <laughs> which I remember not romantically, although several of my siblings remember very romantically because they, my brothers would string out these long balloons and I mean, they were little and still annoying. And, you know, they were, we were all squunched up in this car and they usually had car trouble and we'd stop at all the little farmer's markets and there'd be peaches and you'd have your feet up. And I mean, I was getting to be a teenager and to me it was a little bit of hell. Mm. But if you talk to my older sister, she will wax eloquent about how great it was. The one thing we did learn to do is sing in those cars because we sang all the way, learned lots of harmony, learned lots of songs, and that was a fun part. Yeah. But it was a long, hot trip with no air conditioning. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> and you you mentioned your your schooling that um, you had some very good teachers. I actually did, which seems odd in a small town like that. But I did have some interesting. Um, teachers. I felt like it, I had had a pretty good education, although once I got to Emory I learned that there were people who had a lot better education than I did. Um, I was not the star of Emory. I was one of the stars of high school. Mm. Uh, um, so that was probably good for me. Um, yeah, so once I went away to Emory, though, I never went back to Palatka because my parents moved. And what year had they moved to Palatka from Orlando? Oh, well, let's see. I was in the fourth grade, and I was born in 45. So what would that have made? Because my dates are always... So what, was I nine or something? So in the 54? Yeah, or something like okay. That? And what were your your interests or aspirations, um, influences as a, as a, as a child person? and through high school up until yeah, college? Yeah, that's a good question. I, my sister, who I saw as quite nervous, she captured the role of, she was four years ahead of me, so I was never in high school with her, but she was like a national merit finalist, mm -hmm. semi-finalist, uh, she was real nerdy. She wasn't very cute. Uh, she, <laughs> she had all these nerdy friends. I mean, I did not aspire to be my older sister. She had that place cut out for her. And she looked really old. I remember looking at the pictures that she, now she's like, looks the best of any of us. But anyway, <laughs> she looked really old. She was elected most likely to succeed. So she was that person. And I came along and was much more frivolous and probably always have been, <laughs> but very, uh, I mean, I just wanted to have fun and did mm -hmm. a, a lot. And we were sort of known as, because if you're a very good student, you can get away with a lot in high school. And we were always good students, always. I mean, so, and we were part of the school establishment, too. We were class officers, and we were active in the National Honor Society, and we, I mean, we were those people, but we, I, that's, my sister was probably not as wild as I, but we also, we did things that were considered wild in those days that seemed very innocent today. Mm -hmm. We rode around in convertibles and smoked cigarettes, or almost got thrown out of cheerleading because you smoked a cigarette or, I, I mean, just, we had parties when our parents went out of town. When, I mean, we just had a, f and we were known, I mean, my parents were well known in the town, so we were sort of accepted. I, yeah, I, I had some good teachers. I had a good Latin teacher. I had a good I had some good math teachers, although it didn't take for me so much. I mean, but I did. I recognized that, and I, what else? Mm, I had some very bad teachers also. History, yeah. The liberal arts, I think, is where our family was always the strongest. Maybe not my poor father, who was probably stronger in science, and maybe my brother should have been, but it was the liberal arts where we 
But I thoroughly enjoyed high school. I mean, I had a very good time in high school. And your mother, did you say that she had studied in? She had studied, that was her bent also. I mean, we were the yeah. family in Palaka that got the New Yorker or the New York Times or whatever. I mean, we were that family, even though we, we certainly weren't rich. But yeah, there was sort of an intellectualism brought especially by my mother, I think, um, that pervaded the family, made us feel a little different, but certainly not in a bad way. We felt, you know, yeah, we get the New Yorker. Um, Did your mother work, work outside the house? No, so? and that became a big issue. I mean, this was, again, pre-women's liberation. She should have. She was an excellent writer, um, very talented person, did not work outside the home. Now, it's funny because I think that as long as we were there, as long as she had kids, I, don't, I can't say this for certain, I wish I could ask her now, but I think she really enjoyed that part. I mean, I see my daughter and I think, gosh, it's such hard work, how could you? But I think my mother, she had, we had fun with her, and I think she had fun with us. My father, his first job when we were in Orlando was as a salesman. So he was gone too, a lot. We lived out on a lake. It was a great place to grow up. I mean, we swam and we had boat, just little fishing boats and stuff like that. Um, and mother was, I mean, mother did it. We have avocado trees. Daddy would be there on the weekends, but she really brought up the kids, which was how it was. Mm -hmm. Now, I say she enjoyed it, I, I think, she, I wonder, because that's as hard, because she was also very talented herself, mm -hmm. and I didn't, she didn't really have an outlet for that, except the letters she wrote us, I mean, which I wish we'd kept all of them. Later, as we went away, she wrote, she used those carbon papers, and we'd all get the same letter every week from Mother, and we all looked forward to it. It was like a little New Yorker letter. Yeah. But she did, she never, she did not drive and was a terrible driver. But when we lived way out on this lake, she had this old Jeep and she would drive us to school sometimes, no driver's license. I mean, so, and yeah, now once we moved, that was like, oh, I don't know if I'm, did I mention Lake Rose before? But yeah, okay, now in Palatka, she sort of came into her own in a different way than just a mother. Because she got, she, became involved in the traditional things that women become involved in, but she loved it. I mean, she got a, she was a big garden club person. Um, beautiful flowers in the house all the time. I mean, garden, I mean, she, so she, she lived beautifully. There were three, mo three meals a day. She was a lovely cook. She was interested in presentation. I mean, it was, she was sort of that kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, she had good friends. She read a lot. What else did she do besides outside? Well, she was active in the church in some capacity, but um, I'm not sure. I mean, she always was like challenge. She loved to like be the sort of challenger of whatever the dogma was in the church. Uh, she. Uh, while I was there, now my, again, my brother's, my brother is nine years, years younger, so she was definitely bringing up kids, mm -hmm. mostly, I'm sure. But she also became part of the community in a way that she couldn't when we lived farther out. And, then, and even then, she got this, bought this old car. She was determined to drive, which my father really didn't want her to do because he didn't want her to drive. I mean, just, he liked have, getting to take her around, I guess. But she bought this old car, terrible driver, and so part of our fun of high school was like honking the horn at mother and watching her sort of drive off the road or something. I mean, we were relentless. But, but anyway, she, um, yeah, they moved from Palatka and I think that was very hard for her because she had some really good friends by then mm. and a sort of group that was more like her. Um, I mean, they were 
good friends with the editor of the newspaper, who was much more liberal than uh, yeah. And let's see, when I was a, I guess I was a junior at Emory, Daddy sold that company and moved to Deland. And did he go to work for somebody there? He might have gone to work for, a, he had a good offer and went to work for somebody with a larger company. And they had a lot more money than we had had previously mm -hmm. in Valaca. But I think that was very hard on Mother because she was real established. In, um, and it was very hard on my younger sister who was a senior in high school. So, but they stayed in Deland for I don't know how many years um, and then moved again to Lake Placid where by then my sister was at Vanderbilt, my younger sister. At one point, and I don't see how they did it, this is how much they all believed in education. I was at Emory and Jenny was at Vanderbilt and we never had a lot of money. I'm sure it was less expensive then. Mm -hmm. But still, still that's, they're that's, still private schools. They're still private schools, and so I'm, they impressed me. Jenny dropped out of Vanderbilt and ended up at FSU, but yeah, so they did move, where were we? I'm not sure. Well, let's go um, to Emory. What, how did you choose Emory? Um, it's funny. There was an Episcopal priest who moved to Emory. There was an Episcopal priest in Palatka who was way too wild for Palatka. His name was Jerry Zeller. And he was liberal. He had interesting discussions in church, and he wasn't real popular all the time. I think he also kind of gossiped. I mean, I think there were things like that that I wasn't privy to. We liked him. I mean, he was big into young people, and um, and he actually moved to Emory, and at that point encouraged me to apply to Emory. I had, you know, I was, I really didn't. I mean, I know, knew I was going somewhere, but I, I don't know how. I think that must be why I ended up at Emory. Because um, I don't think I applied anywhere else, maybe to the University of Florida or something, mm. but Emory became my, where I wanted to go. I visited, I liked it. I got, I got into a city um, and ended up at Emory. And so what year did you start? I started in 63. Okay. And at that point, my feeling looking back is that Emory was so conservative. I mean, my senior year, Emory had affirmation Vietnam. I'll never forget that. Other schools were, you know, Columbia, you were occupying the president's office and having demonstrations, and Emory had affirmation Vietnam. I mean, I look back at Emory, I don't regret going there, but, um, and my daughter also went to Emory, but I think it must be very different now. I hope so. It, I, I enjoyed my years at Emory, but I, was, I feel like I was a blank slate in a lot of ways. And so mm, I joined a sorority and really that didn't interest me that much. I got out of a sorority. I... Uh, I went to a lot of fraternity parties. I just, I liked some of my studies, but wasn't really good at them, even in English, where I was noted as this really great writer back in Palatka, but it was all this little creative writing, and this was not that. Mm -hmm. This was you're reading novels and you're analyzing them, mm -hmm. which I had never done or been trained to do. So that was a huge revelation, but also it, it interested me, but I did not do well. In fact, I didn't learn that until I started teaching school, I think. But, so I would say I was sort of a mediocre student at Emory. I love being in Atlanta. Um, I don't have that many friends left from Emory. It's funny, I don't keep up with those people very much. I don't go to the reunions. Uh, I, as I became older, and 
Well, now there were some good things that did you know Altizer? What was his first name? Who was the God is Dead? Did you know a professor at Emory? He was on the cover of Time magazine all the Okay. Year. Okay, so there was a big, he may, it was sort of scandalous in a good way for Emory because his whole thing was God is dead. And so there were some interesting things, I'm sure, going on at Emory more than I was interesting. <laughs> uh, but I did take advantage of Atlanta. I learned the bus system. I didn't drive. Uh, and made a lot of good friends at that point. Well, made some friends at that point. Um, and my senior year, I met Gene Guerrero, who also happened to be around Emory. He's a little older than I am, but began to get involved in what was interesting and what was going on in the world, uh, which was the 60s. I mean, Gene ended up at the bird. Yeah. And really, that's how I did. And he had sort of a little group and we did like protest affirmation Vietnam and I began to do things like that that led me to other things. Um, but right after Emory, and you know I cared so little about Emory, it's so funny in a way that I told my parents don't, don't come to my, I don't care, don't come to my graduation. And I can't believe they didn't, mm -hmm. but they didn't. They mm -hmm. took me at my word. I mean I would never have let my my daughter graduated without being there. But anyway, they, they didn't come. And that's how much I cared about it at the end. Yeah. It, what? How did you find Atlanta when you moved here? What, was, what were your impressions? Um, what was the city like? Uh, well, for me, it was a city. I mean, the city. Because I'd come from Palatka and... St. Augustine and Jacksonville, which is sort of a nowhere city now, it, it was then a little bit more than know-how. But I enjoyed what I, I enjoyed uh, some interesting movie, foreign films I'd never seen. There was a good bus system. I didn't drive. I, I don't think a lot of people, I don't even know if cars were allowed at that point. And I enjoyed just the social life of it. I was free, too. And I was dying to lose my virginity. <laughs> I mean, I had been a very conservative. I myself was very conservative that way. I mean, we were like sort of backwards kids. Even St. Augustine kids seemed much more sophisticated to us than Palatka kids. They had the beach. They had a lot more freedom at night than we did. I mean, we were from this town that... I remember being asked to be taken home when I was way in high school because my date drank. I mean, so I was a real straight little person. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, I came in contact with a lot of new ideas, even in courses that I don't remember well. Uh, English, certainly. Religion. Um, who else did I think were good teachers? I, I guess those two, history, English, and religion. I did so poorly in geology. I took geology thinking it would be the easiest. For me, it was like I couldn't tell one rock from the other or care much. And biology, you know, I did so well, but it was only because I could memorize. You know, I never, my, I'm married to a, geolo um, to a biologist now who can't believe what one I can still remember the Krebs cycle, but I have no idea what it means. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, and I always, I always just told him I had a lab partner. You'd get a, some young man. They were all medical students to be your lab partner, and then you could. I would write up whatever he told me, but yeah. I never understood. So, I don't claim Emory as as my intellectual awakening. Sort of part of my sexual awaiting, but I had to sort of seduce them, I mean, but, <laughs> yeah, it's, to, oh, now there were, Altizer was a good professor, and Bob Dylan came to Emory that year, too, which was, like, a real awakening. Oh, uh, other things happened at Emory, as I remember now. I mean, Ch Kennedy was killed. Then, after I first got there, John F. Kennedy was killed in November of 63. Mm -hmm. And we had just gotten there. And that was like earth shattering, really. Um, 
And I was at Emory, and that was memorable because we all went over to the the church there and just huddled. And yeah, that was a big thing um, that colored those years. Who else? Um, mm, I was going to say somebody else. Bob Dylan came. I was trying to think of. It's pathetic because I'm sure I had much more of a life. Oh, we did move off campus, and um, the woman who sold us the house sold us, rented us the house. It was almost in Decatur in those days, which was not the same as it is now, certainly. Uh, but, uh, and she said, the only reason I've ever rented to college students is because I'm afraid they'll burn the house down. And we, and we were four very nice girls and we said we'll never burn the house down but guess what happened we burned the house down we did literally one of my roommates had dried some clothes on this little stool that just got embers on it or something and she just put it outside and sort of put it out on the back porch and sure enough I mean I was out I had a lot of boyfriends I was out with on a date and just followed the fire engines right to our house and all everything was lost uh our stuff was lost not because so much of the fire but because of the firemen i mean mm -hmm. but so those are the things i mostly remember about emory were which aren't very deep what the, what? and the city you talked about the city okay there were plays there was a fox theater there were good places to eat, a little ethnic food. I mean, not much in those days. Um, I think I was in my first, this my senior year, I was probably in my first, uh, well, also the, also the, SL, the SCLC was here. There were things going on politically that were very exciting, even though my involvement sort of came later on. Um, I was in my first march here for Julian Bond. Mm. What year would that have been? Not sure if that was Emory or when I was with the bird. Uh, when he was trying to be seated as the, uh, they had an alternate delegation. Um, that was a big thing for me to be in a march. Uh, downtown Atlanta and began to get involved in things. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, I saw the direction I wanted to go and what was happening and here I was. And so, but I graduated and went immediately to Europe, which was, all, had always been my plan. So, my parents gave me a thousand dollars to go to Europe, which was supposed to last me for a year or however long I was going to stay. My roommate was supposed to go with me, but she got a boyfriend. Um, and so I just took off by myself. I had two months. What I knew I had already was two months at a Goethe Institute, mm -hmm. teaches you German, in a little town, Grafing, by Munich, near Munich, where you lived for two months and theoretically learned German. I mean, I sort of learned German, mm -hmm. but I met a lot of wonderful Europeans. I mean, the theory is your common language is German. So a lot of serious language to, I mean, my best friend was Italian, and we met, I met a Canadian, which we spoke English, and I sort of learned German. Um, and that was an amazing year, really, for me, too. You uh, spent the whole year there? I spent exactly a year there. Uh, one thing I didn't, so... I sort of grew up there in a way. Um, after, and I, I might have made a mistake, but anyway, after spending, I guess it was three months at the Goethe Institute, I had to make money because during the summer before going to Europe, I'd like spent a lot of money. I could only get a one-way ticket. My, which I couldn't tell my parents because it was supposed to. I was supposed to get a round trip too, but I got a, a one-way ticket, knowing I'd figure out some way to get home. Uh, and so, uh, made good friends in at the Goethe Institute and traveled around with them for probably 
three months. I still had that much money, three or four months. Just We just traveled. And her parents really disliked me. She lived in Milan. She was a good Catholic. She was one of the most interesting students I'd ever, people I'd ever met because she'd been a, a, a exchange student in this country. Mm-hmm. And her insights into this country were so interesting too. And she was a she was a devoted Catholic and talked about the problems with being a Catholic. But very we we just traveled for three months together with this Canadian young man too, and that was just so much. Fun. I mean, we stayed in hostels and we saw the cities and I saw museums and I just I was like became a little more cosmopolitan than before. Mm-hmm. Um, we tra- when we traveled to Italy, the Albanians wouldn't let Americans in. I remember that so clearly. So they went in. I mean, the Canadians, and they went in, they, but they wouldn't let Americans in, which was sort of a... I've always wanted to go to Albania now, I think you can, <laughs> because during it. So um, we were st- I was still in Europe when Czechoslovakia was invaded. I think. I remember all the Czechoslovakians coming out. Uh, then I went, after I ran out of money, I did take a job, which was probably an error, um, with the U.S. Army in a, a, in a, on an American base in Kaiserslautern, which still has a huge American base there. And it was in an Army Education Center. So I could teach uh, GED classes and administer GED tests, which is what I did there. And mm, it was fine too, in a way. I mean, I'd never had that kind of job before. I learned a lot about that. I, I realized that GIs weren't all just baby killers and, <laughs> and I mean, regular old people. Um, I went to Yugoslavia and had an abortion. <laughs> uh, and traveled a lot. Why Yugoslavia? Was that? Yugoslavia was because it was legal. Okay. Oh, it was not legal for foreigners. In fact, it turned out to be a big adventure. It's a funny story, but I became pregnant and had no idea what to do. So there was a woman who worked in the a German woman who worked in the same office I did in this Army Education Center, and I confided in her because I didn't know what else to do. And she told me about this travel agent who was here who could get me to Yugoslavia, Zagreb. Um, And there was a family, he had done it before. There was a family there who would take me in and feed me for some paid. And after hours, there was a doctor who would admit, who would give his abortion. And I was pretty desperate. I mean, and so I did that. I flew to Zagreb and his only request of me, this travel agent, was that I bring him back some Oh, well, what's the name of the liqueur? Um, oh, you would recognize the name. Some very clear liqueurs, Glenona Victor. But anyway, that I had to come back and bring him this liqueur that he could only get in Yugoslavia, something. So I agreed and I did, but... Um, and he knew the purpose of why you were going. The yes, he agent. did. Okay. Yeah, he he maybe he was like running a little thing. I yeah. don't know. I didn't know more than just that he was willing to help me. Mm-hmm. And so I did all of that. Don't ask me how I did that by myself. I flew to to Zagreb, and the woman that had a very modest little house, and she made money on this. You paid her for room and board, um, and. It was a funny thing because um, I could speak a little German and the Yugoslavians could too. 
and they assumed I was German. I mean, I had a very American accent, but they probably had a worse accent. And mm. But what I found out later, I was so happy not to be known as an American, was they hated the Germans more than they hated the Americans, I think. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, they had been, they were, you know, they'd been occupied and stuff. But um, actually, it's a funny thing to say, but I had quite an adventure there too, staying with this family in Zagreb. I mean, this sort of dark, but right, I remember it was right on a river, and the woman helped me the whole time, took me after hours to a doctor, and did this abortion. Um, no anesthesia, no nothing. So, but I was so happy. Yeah. I mean, so happy. Uh, it's funny when people say it, it'll ruin your life or you'll never get over it. I mean, it didn't ruin my life, and I got over it because I thought it would ruin my life if I was in no, I was not a grown up. Mm. I shouldn't have a child. So, so that was part of my experience. <laughs> How long did you have to stay? Well, I stayed about a week, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And went swimming and met some people, and she cooked me these great. They seem like Hungarian stews, and I remember it except for the actual abortion as a rather, sounds kind of scandalous, but as a rather interesting time. Yeah. So, that happened. <laughs> and it's funny too, well, this is, came later in my life, but after I'd worked at The Bird, I mean, so many people, I mean, abortions were a discussed item and people often came to the bird for help with what how to do this or it still wasn't legal at all right I think was it legal in some states because I anyway there were places you could yeah. get abortions and and the the bird certainly advertised referral and they counseling did. They and, did. and then once row they did and so was I was so used to being with people who were sort of open about that kind of thing um, and had had an abortion too, that when I went back to, I eventually taught school in St. Augustine and sitting around with teachers and I would say, yeah, I had an abortion. And this whole table would just like fall silent. I mean, it was like, that's how naive. I mean, how I thought the whole world was like, it had my same experience, mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. so, and I didn't get a job at that school either, so, which was probably the reason. But anyway, that did happen. By that time, um, so much had happened in the United States. I mean, Robert Kennedy had been killed. Martin Luther King had been killed. So you were gone for like 68. I was <laughs> gone for that year, and that was just during the Democratic Convention that year, which was a complete... I mean, um, that I said I have to go home. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had good friends who somehow got me home on a military plane. And I'm sure it was not legal, or, but I mean, that's how I got home. Because <laughs> I was still had friends at this, I was still in Kaiserslautern. Mm -hmm. I had to take back the Slivovich, that's the name of that liqueur that he wanted. Um, so. I did that. I made my goodbyes with the Army Education Center and flew home on a military plane. I think I was supposed to be a captain's wife or something. I think I had an ID. I mean, something. Wow. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow I got home and. And where did you get, where did you arrive back to? I, ar I, ar I arrived back. My parents by that time had moved to Lake Placid, Florida. Okay, again, my father had bought a little gas company there. Only my brothers were still at home, mm -hmm. my younger brothers. And it's in... Um, and are, young, are your younger brothers twins or No, just no, really but they're close? very close. Okay. I mean, they're like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I think of them, I still call them the boys, yeah. in which they correct me, but... The boys were still at home, and they had a beautiful house on a. This is Lake Placid, Florida. Mm -hmm. It's I don't know your 
it's in the middle of the state. It was big orange grove country. Um, very conservative, very racist. And by that time, um, my whole family had gotten involved in what was going on in the 60s. Now wait, am I thinking this right through? Was this after the murder? No, that's right. Okay. Oh, yeah. There was, my last stop in Europe, too, was, I guess I flew out of London home. So it was one of my last stops where I discovered this, uh, uh, it wasn't exactly a hostel, but a, a hostel run by all these Dutch guys. <laughs> and so I'm just bringing that back up because they later came to visit me. But anyway, uh, and spent a very fun three weeks, my last three weeks in Europe, just helping in this B&B in, it's funny, London? And then flew home. Anyway, I flew home to Lake Placid, where I was not going to stay. But that's where my parents were living. And stayed with them for a while until I decided what to do. They were, they were living there. My father had a gas company. My brothers were in school there. My mother finally had gotten this little job in the high school, which she just loved to have something. <laughs> uh, but it was one of the most racist parts of Florida, you can imagine. And at that point, there was a day that everyone was supposed to wear black armbands to protest the war, and my mother did, and my brothers were threatened with their lives, and they took black people to the prom, and I mean, they had that kind of year there. And so my younger, my very young, my next to the younger brother, Bill, graduated from Lake Placid, then my parents moved because they really sort of feared for my brother's life. I mean, and I mean, they didn't think it was a good, safe place to stay. So they moved to Daytona, and my brother just graduated from, I think, Seabreeze High School there, and they didn't stay there long. And so when you came back, you went to Lake Placid? I went just, to Lake Placid just because that's where my parents yeah. were. I soon went back to Atlanta. Okay. And now, in the meantime, the bird had begun. And bef before we get there, I wanted to follow up on a, a couple things. Um, when you were at Emory, how many years did you live on campus? I lived on campus two years for sure, because I lived in Harris Hall. That was a freshman dorm. And then Alabama Hall was... I think I lived two years on campus and then moved off campus with friends. One in a, an old, it was a neat place, but one in an old, one of those old apartments in on Briarcliff. Mm -hmm. And then we moved out to the place that burned down. Um, or, and where did we end up? Where did I end up living? Mm. I, I think in the apartment on Broadcliffe, really, is where I was when I graduated from Emory. And then we lived, after I graduated, we had a very, I had a very wild summer that year because there was a place called the Twelfth Gate. Have you ever heard mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. All kinds of musicians there. So we got, we just hung out. I lived with my roommate, her name was Katie Platter, um, from Moultrie, Georgia, and Ruth Robinette, who was also, and we lived there and just went and listened to music and hung out with the musicians and smoked a little dope, and I mean, we did that kind of thing. Still, in some ways, we were never huge dope smokers, but anyway, um, and then I went off to Europe. And when you were living on campus, was were the like in loco parentis oh, very policies? Much so. Even though it was beginning to be protested by mm -hmm. people, I mean that was one of the big issues, right, on the West Coast in loco parentis. But was there visitation? No. And we would, I mean, I remember having a guy in my room, and I thought I was being really brave, but I was so stressed out the whole time. I mean. 
No, there was no visitation. I think there was a time when you had to be in or you signed out and they knew where you were going. Oh, very much so. Um, I'm sure that changed dramatically, of course. And I, I think that was definitely, it had to, I think it was both of those dorms. I don't know when that changed. And they were all female dorms. Yes, they were all female dorms. Now what, there was something special about the Alabama Hall, but I can't remember. They were all female dorms, yeah. They would have been, because I remember being kind of shocked when my kids went and they weren't. It was at Emory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know if the, if the men on campus and their dorms, did they have to adhere to those same sign-in, sign-out policies? I don't policies think so. Or I don't think so. I don't think they could have visit, visit I mean, I don't think the girl, the young woman could go visit them. I assume that she's supposed to be back in her place <laughs> or spend the night, but oh no, in the fraternity house, they have fraternity houses. Mm -hmm. So, with there's a lot of drinking mm -hmm. off campus. I, I mean, yeah, oh gosh, I remember because I had not drunk much at all and going to a fraternity party which was spiked with um, what do you call it, alcohol, just. Alco just pure alcohol? What yeah. do you call that? There's a word for it. It's not like denatured or something, but it was like just alcohol and maybe cranberry juice or something. Just awful. And being so ill. Then and another time when we tried to drink in the dorms, and I think we drank something like rum and coke. I mean, just something horrible that today, even thinking about it today, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that sweet. But, and just being very, very ill both of those times. So it sort of cured me from just that kind of drinking. Mm -hmm. And that was early on. And you had also mentioned um, that when you arrived at Emory that you were just so anxious to, to lose your virginity. How did you... I was so anxious to lose my virginity. It was like a sort of, with my generation, it was sort of like a philosophical question or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one you thought about and considered and to whom would it be that special or, you know, it was a big deal to lose your virginity and I think I spent half of my time in high school just protecting my boobs. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, you do uh, some heavy petting but, you know, you stopped at a certain point. I'm sure this wasn't true with everyone but these, these were the girls from Palatka. And I even found out it wasn't true for all of them, but <laughs> they were having much more. Uh, but no, I had done all that, and but I could tell it was something that it was worth trying out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, so yeah, I managed to do that. Mm. Now I, I was actually living off campus so there was another place we lived off campus where was that it must have been in my junior year did it take that long I even remember who it was um, I think he was losing his virginity too but I mean because it, what I wouldn't say it was a very fulfilling sexual experience <laughs> experiment but it was something we were living in the strangest place, and I have no idea where it was, but it was like a place that had been created to add a few more rooms to a little place and make it a place where college kids could live. So I had these little dark rooms, I think with no windows or something. And so we had this very dark place where you could sort of get naked. I mean, just, but I don't remember it at all as about, I mean, I was so thrilled that I had done something um, naked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really, I mean, and he, we were boyfriend, girlfriend, bro. He was, a, I remember he was a KA, which is like probably the most Southern, and, you know, they would uh, secede from the Union every year. I'm sure this, I mean, this went out hopefully long before 
I mean, it must have gone out pretty soon after I was there. But they would secede for, they'd all grow these beards, and they'd all dress as Confederate soldiers. This is how, this is him. And, yeah, and I would go, I, I remember going to the, what'd they call it? Something ball. Something horrible. I don't know, the K.A. ball, the Kappa Alpha ball, or, yeah. I had to be my sophomore year, because I don't think I did all that fraternity stuff that much longer. Mm -hmm. um, but I did manage to lose my virginity, which was quite an accomplishment in my view. But then I had to be his girlfriend for a long time, because yeah. it's sort of like I'd committed myself, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> did do you recall like thinking about contraception and oh that? yes oh my gosh that was a big I mean that was a big concern right yeah. pregnancy huge and the pill came out and what year was that I feel like googling that what? maybe sixty three I think so okay the pill was out and I at that point had slept with somebody and was so scared that I might get pregnant. So I remember going to, I don't think it was the Emory Clinic because it seemed so, you didn't want anybody to know. I mean. Um, and they very well might not have given it to you unless you were married. I think, well, they did give it to me. But I, I remember writing a fake name. That's what was so funny. But my hand was like shaking. So, I mean, it was like ah, so hard. I can't remember what the name was. No, they did give it. I, I mean, they did give it to me. Uh, I don't remember what I had to do. Very strong mm -hmm. pills. I mean, no, I wonder what they did to it. But it certainly kept you from being pregnant. So, to me, it was a very liberating and you think that could have been the Emory Clinic where you went? I can't imagine that it would have been the Emory Clinic. Mm -hmm. Because it seemed like such a big deal. Yeah. Now, well, girls talked about things like that. And but had you talked with, did you talk with your girlfriends? Or with the... About with all that? We talked at length beforehand. I yeah. mean, we were, a lot of us were in the same position. Mm -hmm. I think by now people have been sexually active for longer, maybe not, but yeah, no, it was a, it was a, certainly a, a topic of discussion a lot, and I know the people that I lived with then certainly had to know, and I can't remember, were they sleeping with somebody too? I don't. I honestly don't remember. So self-obsessed at that point. Um, Do you yeah. recall talking to the guys about the guy that that I had my boyfriend? At yeah, that your point? boyfriend. Or and, other guys. And if if there were subsequently other guys you slept with, would you talk to them discussion? about about having sex? What that meant? Not nearly so much. No, no. By then I had been launched, sort of. I mean, oh, contraception? I made sure that I had contraception. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't think for a long time I... And I can't say it was very experimental. Mm -hmm. It was just <laughs> the rudiments. Yeah. But... But it was, it was still very exciting, and I was very. I thought I was very in love. I think it. I think it had to go together, sort of, in those days. And you know, we got better at it. And so, <laughs> so I, I remember it. Something that was a part of my education that I was happy to have had. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> it was very exciting. And yeah, oh yeah, I think the summer after that, the summer after that year, I went with some friends to work in, I'd forgotten all about this, in Maine, in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, just to, so I didn't go, you didn't, you went away your first, you went back home, I did at least, my first year, 
and by then I felt so different from everybody. And you know, you were so big city, and they were still little Palatka people. So I didn't. Uh, the next year we went to Maine to work. They worked in a restaurant, and I worked in this uh, in Booth Bay Harbor, which is now a big tourist place. But then it was a sort of a small lobstering little town in Maine that was very cute. And I worked in this gift shop that had me cut out labels that said made in Japan because it was all products of Maine. <laughs> so it was this gift shop with these two older women. I mean, they I'm sure they probably were I'm not as old as I am now, but they seemed ancient to me. They ran that gift shop and they had never seen a black person. But they had very strong views about the South. I mean, but I it had a wonderful time there. Oh, just wonder. It was all college kids working there. We had our own apartment. We had, I had boyfriend. I mean, I had a boyfriend there who would go into Brown, and I visited him the next year, and we were all in love too, for because we. And I mean, we were all. And he had had more experience than I, but was just so delighted. We're just delighted with sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, that yeah, that was a very fun year. Um, it's fun to think about all those things. And then came back to yeah. I just I went straight through. Was I the last one in my family? I think my older sister and I were the last ones in my family to just go straight through school. I thought that's how you did it. Mm -hmm. My brothers would drop out and take, go to Hawaii to surf, and my younger sister dropped out of Vanderbilt like a few semesters before she graduated because she was still, like she was missing something. Or I mean, so but we just went straight through. Yeah. We thought you did that then, and I'm, I'm kind of glad I did. I mean, because I had a degree then. Right. Use it or not. But. Mm -hmm. And when. I'm, I'm going to jump here. Uh, Please. When you were in you Europe, uh, you spent much of 1968 there. Yeah. Um, A lot of freedom. And how aware were you of, you mentioned Czechoslovakia. Um, oh, we were, we went a lot, yeah, we traveled a lot. Of the stuff going on, like, you know, May 1968, Paris. Yeah. And Berlin. Oh, yes, and yes. Like All of that was happening. Now, I have to yeah, it's say... it's quite a time. <laughs> it was quite a time. That was 68. That's right. Um, and I was not heavily involved in anything but sort of knowing about it and being so interested and so homesick for what I saw going on at home at that point. I mean, I did. I I never went into East Berlin. My older sister had. Mm. I mean, I didn't. I wish I had, because I wanted to see if, you know, maybe it was better. I mean, yeah. by then we were open to all things that weren't capitalist, right? But I'd never went into. I w I think I was just sort of a free spirit for a long time, mm -hmm. and, yeah, it. I I got my education at the bird. Yeah. Really. So I came back home, came back to Atlanta. No plans, no nothing. Uh, but I had a roommate in Emory, and since during the year of 68, she had married a guy named Nelson Blackstock. I remember that. And they were members of the Socialist Workers' Party. Now, I didn't know this. And they had an office in the downstairs of the birdhouse on 14th Street. They rented them an office down there. And so first I stayed with Ruth and Nelson, but uh, I finally rented in that basement of the birdhouse. If you could see this room, you would laugh so hard because it was like the furnace room mm -hmm. of the whole house. And it was just this little tiny room where I had a little tiny bed and this huge furnace with all these, it looked like a big huge octopus or something. 
that with all these vents going in all different rooms that all night long would come on and go <laughs> and sends heat there and heat there and heat there. And I was down in this little dark room. In fact, Bob Goodman said, that's the first time I ever saw you. I Because, well, I went down to the SWP offices and there was this girl who was living in this room with this furnace. I mean, it was just me in this huge furnace. But for some reason, it was so cool, and the bird was upstairs. And I immediately found out who had the, who, where the energy was, where the cool people were, where it was very fun to be, and that was upstairs at the bird. So the SWP was, I mean, they were known as the Trotskyites and the marxist leninists just floated them down the rivers on, you know, logs and stuff. They were just killed off during the Russian Revolution. So, I mean, the SWP wasn't nearly as fun as, or interesting, or the people were serious. And I don't know, there was just such a cultural difference between the two. The bird was just like a place of pure excitement, joy, interest, you know, earnestness, education, intellectual discussions. It was just a hotbed. I mm -hmm. mean, it was just, I thought, wow, I, where have I found myself? So I eventually... And is this 1969 at this point? No, or this late? is still 68. And I hadn't realized that the bird, I thought I missed a whole year of the bird. Mm. But I really didn't because I came back in October and I've forgotten what month did they? They started, I think publication started in March. Okay, so, so they were that old. And, and so when you moved back, you reconnected with this friend Ruth? Ruth, yes, a, a friend of mine who's Ruth. But the two, they were all part of the Socialist Workers Parties. And they put out, they'd been going on for years, and they put out some dull little magazine. And Still, I, I mean, I was so happy to get in this place. And, you know, they, I mean, even they were interesting to me, right? I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who was involved. Was, and but did you rent the room from them? I rented it from probably the SWP people. Okay, yeah. And at some point, I started working for the ACLU, but I, I can't figure out the years. I leave them out. I don't know. I mean, I worked for them off and on for a long time because I know I had to be making some money somehow. And, and was the first place that you, and was that the first place that you set up residence when you moved back to Atlanta? In the yeah, well, I stayed with my friends a few weeks, and yeah, it was. And I moved right in there. I moved right in there. And then I, set, I knew Jean a little bit, Jean Guerrero, and after a while, I started mingling more with the bird. And then I found out they needed a place. They needed somebody to live in the back of the birdhouse. There was a, there was, it was a big old house. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of it. And they had a kitchen, a big old kitchen that they didn't use much. And then this little sort of back porch room. It was like, it could be a bedroom. And they wanted somebody to live there. Now, Stephanie and Tom lived there for a long time, but they moved out finally because they had kids. And, and maybe the Gwens moved there too, lived there too for a while. But anyway, those people were not living there then, upstairs. So they needed a person to live there in case the bird was firebombed, which seemed like that would never happen. But you could drag your body to the phone and call somebody and get some help. And that was me. So, okay. I was ready. <laughs> so I moved up to to those rooms in the bird and lived there. I mean, I remember living there and eventually just getting to be part of the bird, mm -hmm. sort of peripherally at first. And then uh, I'm sure I made a boyfriend, I, you know, and uh, became just got to know him. And started hanging out there and there. Then probably my name went on the stat box. I mean, mm -hmm. soon. 
<laughs> well, you lived there. <laughs> I lived there, but still, I, w I still had to be integrated into. But I started to go into all their meetings. I mean, it was just such an exciting place to be. It was like day and night because, you know, it would all be composed and discussed and gone over in the day, and then the layout, essentially women would come. I mean, there was this sort of divide. I don't know. But that layout would start going on all night, which I was just like fascinated by. Stephanie and Linda Fibben. You haven't interviewed her either, have you? Not Linda, no. Oh my gosh. I can't understand that either. I want to call them up and say please, because they're real important people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know what her thing is either, but something. Um, anyway, it was just like, I don't know what it was like, like the most ideal place to learn that I've ever been in my life. The most exciting, intellectually interesting place. And I feel like I was sort of a blank slate at that point, really. So, and it just became part of that. I mean, very welcoming people, wanted all the help they could get. I mean, I, I tried to remember, my memory was that the men made $40 a week and the women made 20 but it, that's not anybody else's memory. So I don't, I, it might not be true. I can't tell. I mean, it's, because Stephanie said, well, I don't remember that. She said, I don't remember who, how people got paid or who got paid or it certainly wasn't much or if anybody got paid because I know the Gwens had some, um, who, were, who was it, the organ, was it CETA? There was some grant or wait, it wasn't the P, it might have been like the Domestic Peace Corps. It was some, one of those programs that gave. Uh, the VISTA? VISTA, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. So they had some money from that, that they came to the bird instead of did whatever VISTA. And I don't know if Tom had money from his grant. It, you know, he was supposed to be a graduate student at Emory. Mm -hmm. And he instead came to the bird. So maybe there was a little money that way. And then uh, a lot of us worked for the ACLU. Uh, what were, what were we talking about? Oh, just moving up. That's what it, when I just moved up and just was, I mean, it was one of the happiest periods of my life. It was, one, it was just so inclusive. I mean, you were part of things. It's like you were so proud of what you were doing. And I started, my first job was advertising because I was sort of cute. I mean, Exploited sure. that way, right? But anyway, we didn't care. So uh, I remember Linda Fibben and I would be sent out to advertise, and we'd go to record stores and stores along that strip there. It was a big strip for hip people. Mm -hmm. They called them hippies. I mean, we never went, we were radicals, they were hippies. But I mean, so uh, yeah, and we got ads for the bird. That's, I think that was probably my first job. So you were on paid staff? I don't think so. I don't know. I really don't have any memory of whether I was or wasn't. I probably wasn't. I mean, I was new. I mean, just maybe six people might have been on paid staff. And other people had, like Bob Goodman told me he had a paper route. Because I said, what, well, what did you do for money? Because... He said, well, I had a paper route. He'd been out, out of Harvard, right? <laughs> so I said, really? He said, yeah, that's how I made money. And so I know I worked for the ACLU off and on all those years, but I have no idea at what point. And it was called, the offices were 88 Walton Street. I'll never forget that, because Gene eventually, you've interviewed Gene. Mm -hmm. Don't you love him? I mean, I love Gene. Yeah. But anyway, so... Uh, yeah, I worked for the ACLU. He wasn't there at that point. What were you doing for the ACLU? Just sort of being a bad secretary. I mean, I wasn't very good at I can remember such things I did there, but very loyal. Like if they had to stay up all night and have a brief in, keep the, print, keep the offices open for the, then I would stay up all night. I mean, we'd do whatever we had to do, but I really, I was never a very accomplished secretary, I think, although I worked there a long time. And one of the big perks was if you worked late, 
that late like we used to. Well, it was still dinner time, I guess. They would give you $5, I believe it was $5 for dinner. And there was this elegant old restaurant on that. I was trying to think of the name of it today. I think it was Heron's. Mm-hmm. Was it? There certainly was a restaurant, Heron's. And it was kind of elegant in an old-fashioned way. I mean, it was kind of like a beautiful old hotel lob. It, uh, that's how I remember. Anyway, they had $5 lobster dinners. And so we, and I can't remember who, I know Miller Francis worked there uh, some. I worked there. It's funny, I can't. Jean worked there later and became head of the Georgia ACLU. Um, I think Roger. Roger Friedman. Worked there at some point. At some point. I mean, oh, and Reber Bolt, who was on staff, I don't know if you've interviewed him yet, was a lawyer, and he was an ACLU lawyer. Uh, anyway, I did work there. That must be how I got money. And later, you know, Charles Morgan became the, had you ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. He became the regional he was like a big deal at the ACLU, and he had a regional office there where I worked also. And he was a person with a big ego, very smart, but he sort of liked you to come in and just sort of be an audience for him too while he talked to you about his cases and stuff. But one case that was so exciting, and I just fell in love with this guy too, was, uh, was the Howard Levy case. You probably never heard of Howard Levy. But he was a military doctor who refused to treat Green Berets. He was a dermatologist, and he refused to treat them for skin diseases because he felt like it would contribute to the war effort. Um, and he was court-martialed, and, uh, and the ACLU regional office, because he was from Brooklyn or somewhere. This was a big case. It wasn't just Georgia-based. And Charles Morgan was doing that case, and we worked a long time on it, and he was con eventually convicted, and he spent at least two years in jail. I think he was sentenced to three. But he was, like, the very interesting, and the case was interesting, and the defense was exciting, and... And I eventually got to know him a little bit and visited him in Brooklyn. And I don't, I don't know what happened to. Him. I guess I assume he's still alive because he wasn't. But that was sort of a big, interesting case that we worked on for a long time. I guess all the time I was still at the Bird. I can't mm -hmm. figure. I don't know how all that worked, but I know I had some money. Mm -hmm. And I remember being at the ACLU. And even later worked for some of the, oh, Mary Joyce Johnson, was she at the ACLU? Deb, she, she was never on the bird, I guess, but she was a lawyer. I worked for her law, law office some too, I guess just sometime in my, while I was here at the bird. Um, and his name was Jim Morowitz and David Buffington, okay. Not a good secretary, but still. They were both lawyers that you. They were both lawyers. They were, all three were, and they had an office together, I think. David Buffington, Jim Morowitz, and, Joyce, and Mary Joyce Johnson. And they were left wing. I mean, they did progressive law. And then there was a guy named Al Horn who defended us all the time. You've probably heard about him. Yes. And who was the other older guy um, that defended us all the time? can't remember, but, so, now the bird, too, after I began to be on staff, and I guess when, well, when I first arrived, certainly it was a male-dominated, well-run newspaper, and I think, but very male, even though there were, the wives were, of those males were very Talented women, strong women too. You've met them. Have you met Jean, uh, You've met uh, Nan. Nan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, they were just as strong as the men, but playing a much inferior role at that time. I think uh, that's the way I remember that the men got paid. And the women. Uh, but what was my point? Uh, when well. I arrived, that's how the bird was. It was run by men, 
rather intimidating a little bit for me. He was not at all as educated in Marxism, Leninism, or even some of the more progressive um, who everybody was and who was bad and who was good. And who, but um, I learned fast. And the way, it seemed to me at that point that still, it, I learned later, I didn't know this at the time until rather recently, that I think Bob Goodman came in a few months after the bird began. He wasn't right there at the, he wasn't one of the founders. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was, came in later. And his idea was to give, make many more editors. I think that was a big contribution that Bob made to the bird. So it wasn't just, I guess, Howard Romaine, Jean Guerrero, Tom Coffin, uh, who else would have been in that number? I don't know, certainly not Miller, uh, but. Ted Brodeck in the early. Ted Brodeck probably. I don't remember him as stay. Did he stay on the bird a long time? I not know, a I'm, long I'm still time, a but friend I, of his, but. I remember remember from interviews people talking about sort of the editorial structure and um, I think Ted mentioned yeah. that he was sort of like the international Okay, yeah, that makes piece. a lot of sense. Uh, and when Bob came in, he just said, look, there are people, it shouldn't just be these few editors. Everybody should have a stick and there should be ten editors, like the international, the women's, the culture, the just broken down, the local, the unionization efforts, or whatever, so every, that everybody had a role. Many more people had a role than had at the time, mm. of just women typing or doing, getting advertising or, or gathering news. I know some women wrote too, but not nearly so much. If I, I haven't gone back and looked at those first issues, but is that true? Have you? I mean... I have, and that is, that is probably definitely. true for the, the first several years. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, out of which grew the women's movement. Um, and so, let's see what happened. And now you know, too, that... Um, oh, I used to sell the bird a lot, too, which I always thought was great fun. <laughs> One of the bird sellers. Because we were, we were all cute young things, and would go down. Underground Atlanta had just opened, I guess. I mean, it still seemed seedy even then to me, but Underground, it was all bars and stuff. And then Georgia Tech, those were the two best places to go sell the bird. And I think it was a quarter, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But all those places would give you a dollar. So we would go out, a lot of us, just for fun, and sell the bird. And made a lot of money that way. So whatever they were charging, they'd give you a dollar. They'd give you a tip, especially all those old guys down in underground Atlanta. I mean, they were all had been drinking, and you were selling the bird, and you were these hippies, and you were blah, blah, blah. So, and at Georgia Tech, too, especially after football games or something like that, it was these great places to sell the bird. Because everybody wanted to be associated with the bird in a way, because it was sort of risque or, you know, wild or... Uh, um, so that definitely was, I did make money that way too. Um, and one significant thing that happened to some of us, and it, I had them broken down by where we were at that point. This was still on 14th Street. I don't know at what point we moved to North Avenue, but um, was Sam Massell was, I don't know if he was running for his first term or for re-election, but one of his campaign promises was to clean up that area of the city. I mean, have other people talked about this? I don't think so. Oh, anyway, uh, that was a big part of his campaign because the Bird House was there, and then all the people who lived around there were living in those big old houses, and they, they were full of rentals. And it was hip people, people who sold the bird, some were kind of just hanging out. I mean, it was that part of town that attracted that element. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so, and he was going to clean it up, and also I think there was coming, Colony Square was right behind that effort too, that whole urban, I, I think Colony Square took a long time to build, but they tore down everything in the meantime. I guess that was David Rockefeller's thing, 
But anyway, um, so Sam Sells, a lot of his campaign was going to clean up that area. And one night when we were up doing layout, and um, it was always fun, so much fun to do layout because it was just all laying it out. And there were some really amazing artists. I mean, I guess the Brutus is known for its graphics and design and then a new way to put out news, not just in little columns, straight, long pages, but it's a beautiful, beautifully laid out newspaper. A lot of talent there, especially, I would say, Stephanie Coffin and Linda Fibben, great. There was a woman named Diane Berger. I didn't know her very well, uh, but she was good. And they would tell you others. But I would I would go up there and just lay out a page, too, just cause so, I mean, it was fun. Mm. You were th and it was late at night, and people were having fun, and you took that wax machine, and you, you used, you know, it was a, I guess they did this for a long time in newspapers. It was hot wax that you had the columns. In those days, you had the co it wasn't digital, of course, but you had the columns, straight columns, and then the ground, and you put the wax, run them on the wax machine, and you put them on the page, and then lay out the graphics, and it was a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, so we were there late at night, and the police staged this raid on all the houses around us, arresting all these little hit people. Now, I tried to think, were they, did they find drugs? I mean, I guess. I don't know what the arrest was, but we were outraged, or some of us were out, I mean, we were outraged. So we went out and tried to like help them get out, help them escape, or, you know, tried to like get in there. And also, some of us who were like, ultra leftists. We were criticized later by the more mature people on the bird, like Gene. I was very mad at us. Um, but Bob Goodman was involved, and I was involved, and I don't know if you've interviewed Bob Malone. Anyway, I know those, Bob remembers that there were lots of people arrested. I remember only three of us were arrested, so I don't know who's right. Uh, and we were, we were doing things like yelling, no more pigs in our community. I mean, things that would really endear us to the police. I mean, <laughs> so, and uh, one time they grabbed my sister who happened to be there, and I grabbed her out of their hands. So they arrested us, put us in a paddy wagon, and, and um, tear gassed us in the paddy wagon. Uh, they were so pissed, the police and charged me, I'm not sure what, I guess they charged them the same thing. With so them. it was you and the two Bobs? That's what I remember. Right. Bob remembers more people. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. We'll have to, I meant to check with Bob Malone, too, to see what his memories were. Um, I found out that there's all these different <laughs> memories. <laughs> but So we, they tear gas us in there. They were really mad at us. And they charged me with, inciting to riot, uh, violation of the noise ordinance, and public profanity. So, and took us to jail. And we spent a night in jail, which Bob does not remember now. I know, I spent a night, he thought they just let us go. I said, no, they didn't, damn. But it, it, that was an experience that, in, since it's over, I'm glad I had. Uh, so we spent the night in jail and came out looking pretty bedraggled, but we got a defense and they had, the police had built up this big case about how dangerous it was out there. And then these little, you know, these little people came out. <laughs> and so we had a good defense, Al Horn. I don't remember what it was, but, you know, we were put, let out on, I guess on, maybe, Maybe on our own recognizance, I'm not sure. Because I don't remember having to pay a big bondsman, but we may have had some money and they would have raised money. So we were let out, but I did have that charge on my record and we were never found guilty of anything. It never came up again. Mm. And although we got a lot of support from people and probably help if it, we did have to pay a bondsman or put up bail or whatever, but 
like people like Gene and probably Tom too, or kind of they were mad at us and said, you know, why'd you do that? It's kind of ultra left and kind of silly and kind of indulgent, I think. <laughs> but so that was. It's only funny because when I began to teach school, this came much later. I mean, we were never fingerprinted and things like that. There was not security in the schools like there is today. Mm. I mean, it was, they knew you. But I became a school teacher in the St. Johns County Schools, and I was not fingerprinted until years after I'd been there, like 15 years. I was the department the head of the English department, right? And they said, okay, well, now all the people who haven't been fingerprinted have to be fingerprinted. So uh, I went and got fingerprinted and got this letter from the school board that said, please come explain the following. And they had on my record this inciting to riot. I had kids by then, too, that were like, what? what? <laughs> Public profanity <laughs> and the noise ordinance. So I did, I did have to go put before the school, not the school board, just the school board attorney, who just really, his attitude was, well, you had a lot more fun than I did in the mm -hmm. 60s. Thank goodness. Now, there were other things, too, that came later while we were on the bird. We were on our way to, uh, we were on our way, well, this came after the women. I'm sort of going out of order. Do you care? No, that's fine. Okay, you stop like, me. It, it all relates. I didn't, so, with the incitement to riot, public profanity, um, so you were charged and and went to court. We were charged and, yeah, went to court in front of a judge, um, one jury, in front of a judge. Uh, he may have just, you know, postponed it or whatever you do. I don't know what he did, but we got out of jail that day. Mm -hmm. um, but we did have to postpone. It did stay. We were fingerprinted. I mean, we were all that stuff. Because one, I think inciting to write was like a felony or something. Mm. Um, so, but then we never heard anything else about it. I could have it expunged from my record, but since it didn't hurt me, it's like, I like it on my record. Yeah. <laughs> but so, and it you just, don't recall ever having to go back for like a final hearing no, and as sentencing? As far as I know, we never and, went back for anything. We may have pled, is there, what's, what is the term? Is it no, 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 no contendere? Is that you don't dispute or? Yeah. I don't, I, we may have done that. Or maybe Al got you off? Or? Al got us off for sure. <laughs> but it never came off our records. Mm -hmm. um, which I didn't know till years later. But it, it still didn't hurt me and it was too, I'd already been a teacher too long for them to do anything. Let me see what I have there. Okay, then, the one, then we had to move to North Avenue because of urban renewal on 14th Street. Uh, and I don't, you probably know some of the years, I don't remember what years, when this happened, but we did, we moved over North Avenue. It was kind of a cool place, more like funny little cubicles, but you could see half the person huh? the whole time. <laughs> and that's where I remember the women's movement really getting strong. I mean, I guess it was going on, beginning to go, around the country. I'm sure Miss Magazine had been in, out a long time. People had been talking a long time. We'd been grumbling at a long time, grumbling a long time, I'm sure. Especially people like, maybe people who are married were even more affected, where they did everything in the home and everything at the bird. And, um, but mostly I think it was who ran, who had the power in the bird. And men definitely had the power in the bird. Uh, I talked to Bob Goodman about that. I said, well, what exactly were the issues? I mean, what sparked it? Because I couldn't remember, and he couldn't either. But, I mean, those, those were definitely the issues. Mm -hmm. The men ran the bird, mm -hmm. and the women were helpers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So that we decided that would change. And also, women were kind of jealous of each other. Because of that, I mean, because they were kept apart. If you had any power at all, it was sort of jealously guarded. I mean, it was a way that made it 
difficult maybe for women to trust each other. It created that kind of environment, I presume. Mm. Or we couldn't understand why like Stephanie would complain. I mean, she was so, she was fabulous in layout and she had Tom who was great. And I mean, so anyway, we all got together and found out we had so much in common. I mean, that was a really wonderful time at the Bird for Women too. Um, and put out our own women's issue. And I had, think for a while we had a little, like, we're going to edit every article that's being written by me. <laughs> I'm not sure that lasted long. But, but I mean, we took over for a few minutes, at least, um, and changed, really, changed the culture of the bird, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I think this came after that, after that, all the jobs were supposed to be rotated. So every, I think that was a result of the women's movement. Because Bob said, what, I don't know at point, what point that came in, but that. Okay, yeah, because I know that they did rotate, but I, I don't And it may not have I been the women's movement, but it may, it, I'm sure it was still, you may, the women may have rotated over here or over here, but probably but I think there was a much bigger push to have that be true, mm -hmm. so that the power would really be shared. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and we also did a lot of things together. Um, we would go to conferences together, we would meet with other groups. I mean, we as a, as a women's group, I think, got to be tight and better friends and just it was a good situation for us. And one thing in particular, one conference that we went to was called, um, there was a Liberation News Service. Mm -hmm. Did you hear it? It's sort of like UPS or something. I mean, it was for all the underground newspapers. You could subscribe to it, and they would send you national news or whatever was going on, other news. And um, so we, all the women, got in this old Volkswagen. I, I can't remember who was driving, but of course it was a Volkswagen bus. And we're going to New York to this, to this Liberation News Conference, LNS Conference. And we picked up this little hitchhiker, just because we had room. Mm -hmm. He was like a little kid, and we picked him up. He had a little suitcase and everything. Um, and as we were on the New Jersey Turnpike, going into New York, getting closer to New York, we were pulled over by, I think it was the Highway Patrol, uh, I'm not sure if it's the police or that, and stopped and made to get off the highway and have all our luggage, bags, anything searched. Now, we were pretty savvy about that. I mean, we had nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but this little hitchhiker had, has anybody else talked about this? Had this one... I think he had one joint, or he had some dope, okay, so they took us, they arrested, I mean, they arrested us again. Did they fingerprint it? They fingerprint us, was that on my record too? They may have. But anyway, they arrested us, took us into the police station. Um, now, because most of us had worked for the ACLU, we had friends, so we, we did get out of that situation but we were there for hours and it was we debated whether we should I think some people felt like we should tell on that person but no I mean that did not triumph of course <laughs> we wouldn't nobody would dare tell on the person so we all were equally guilty because nobody would claim the suitcase um, and Finally, we, they let us go. We weren't in jail that time. The, AC, the local ACLU came and got us out of jail, however they did it. I don't know if they posted a bond. I really don't remember how. Um, and they sent us on our way. We did go to the LNS conference. But consequently, later, the ACLU did sue the state of New Jersey for illegally stopping... Volkswagen vans for no reason. I mean, it was illegal to just pull people over because they're in a Volkswagen van, which mm -hmm. is what they had done to us. I mean, so it, there was a sort of good ending to that. I think they stopped that practice yeah. after that. Um, 
so that was one thing. A lot of other stuff that we did while we were on the bird, I mean, we went several marches in Washington, and I tried to remember which ones. <laughs> so pitiful. I even called Bob. I, I thought Bob would have this great memory, and he didn't either. I should have called Steve Weiss, who remembers every scene. Have you interviewed him? Mm -hmm. was, was it for days? There, I think there were a couple interviews. I mean, I should have checked all this with Steve Wise because he would have, he'd know the date probably. But yeah, we we did a lot of going up to marches and you know renting buses or all sleeping all day to get there, demonstrating, getting on the bus and coming back, and thinking that was fun or going up there and sleeping on church benches. And we went to a lot of, dem of big demonstrations in those days too against the war in Vietnam, of mm -hmm. course, you probably heard that. Then at some point, we moved to Westminster Avenue. Was it Avenue or Road? Westminster Road? Again, urban renewal got us on North Avenue, so we had to move and we moved to this place on Westminster. Do you know where that is? Right on the back side of Piedmont Park? Like. Yeah, there's one part that goes, I don't know the directions in this town, but it goes over Piedmont Park and co comes to an end in Piedmont Park. The other goes right through Ansley Park. And my daughter happens to live on Westminster Avenue. I mean, she lives on the part in wh where the fire, where the bird was firebombed. Right. That's, it's so funny that she, her house is on the Ansley Park side of but on Westminster. Mm -hmm. So I think that's so great. But I, you've probably heard stories of this too. But uh, I think people feel like the reason that we got firebombed was the expose of Howard Mosell's, I think it was Howard Mosell's slumlording activities. I don't think it was Sam Mosell's himself, but he was Sam Mosell's brother, who was always, I think he was always thought of as kind of a little bit of a gangster, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, but lots of houses, real substandard houses that didn't meet any requirements, and he was being allowed to continue to do this, and the bird exposed that. And, were, and we were firebombed very quickly after that came out. So we always felt that, that's probably why they wanted to interview Sam Massell. I mean, he was involved in a lot of these strange things that happened to us. Um, and it's funny because nobody was living in that place at the time, which was good, but my younger brothers happened to be in Atlanta at that point, and we were staying in Jean Guerrero's apartment, who must have been out of town for some reason, and I had lived with his, his, um, the Grogan's, his, Nan's brothers and their family for a while. So I think they might have lived on top and we were staying in the bottom because yeah, I can't remember why I was there with parts of my family. Mm. But they were the first one that, we were the first people they called because they meant to call Jean, but Jean was not there. So we got that first call about the firebombing and called everybody and rushed over there. I still have pictures of my younger brothers there with their hair all long and stuff. Um, but the best thing about that whole thing was that we never missed an issue. I mean, the whole town just turned out in support of the bird. I mean, lots of journalists and helped us set up shop. I mean, we immediately moved to, on Juniper Street. This is the last place I ever was, but, I, and a lot of people. By that time, so, oh, we hadn't even talked about the OL and all that, but. Several people had dropped off of the bird by the time we moved to Westminster even. Um, but then the staff that was remaining moved to uh, a place on Juniper Street that all I, I remember and regret now, it was like a beautiful house and I don't know that we left it beautiful. I mean, because now I'm a real preservationist and I just remember it was one of those gorgeous houses on Juniper. I don't know what happened to it. Um, because I, myself, 
at that point was getting much more interested in um, the People's Republic of China. That became my next thing. I had met my future husband, David Nolan, who was a member at that point of the OL, and we haven't talked about that, but I'm sure you've heard it from other people who, I mean... A little. I mean, just complete ultra-leftists. Uh, but we all took them seriously. I mean, I guess Marxist Lenin is going to make the revolution. You know, they were uh, going to become working class. They were going to proletarianize themselves, which, I mean, so they secretly, it was all real secret to, even, I mean, from us who were the petty bourgeois bird by that time in their minds. We weren't Marxist Lenin. So uh, they, several of them had left the bird and Oh, this is back to China. Okay, so I had gotten involved with David Nolan. The war was either winding down or over by that time. Um, Nixon had probably gone to China. I don't know what year this was. I know he went to China in 1972. But anyway, um, we'll talk about the OL. Well, that's a whole long conversation. But anyway, the OL. Uh, I had gotten involved, I left the bird at some point there and went to work with what, an organization called the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association. Um, and it was an organization dedicated to building friendship between the two peoples of the United States and the People's Republic of China, which at that point was called Red China and wasn't even recognized as the legitimate government of China. It was Taiwan, was China, right? <laughs> so, um, and David was involved in that. We had two friends also, B Minor and Bill Cousins, I'll remember them, who had been to China somehow. They had gotten interested in China and they'd gotten in about the same time as Nixon. And they were very interested to build a relationship with the peoples of China. And also because we were so down on capitalism and imperialism and sick of the Vietnam War and sick of the racism exhibited toward blacks and uh, that we were so down on the U.S. that we wanted to look at places that were trying different experiments, okay? Mm -hmm. And we had already heard all the propaganda, propaganda about so many things. You know, marijuana was going to make us go crazy, and, you know, Castro was horrible, and uh, Mao Zedong was horrible. And so uh, we got interested in China, built this organization, and then, and it was supposed to be a broad, as far as China was concerned, we were much more ultra leftist than China. China wanted to be regular old people. If they were just involved in chinoiserie or Chinese, I mean, they want, Chinese wanted it, everybody. But so they offered a trip to people on, in the U.S. China People's Friendship Association. The Chinese government did. The Chinese government did at their expense. Like we, had to, we had to pay for our way there, our airline tickets, and they paid for the whole time we were in China. And it was a 21-day trip. I mean, it was like, and nobody could go to China. I mean, yeah. this was like, and we were like little punks. But anyway. Uh, and you guys formed this organization? We formed it, but it was a national organization. It was a national organization. We formed a local chapter. Okay. So it was a, it was a holdover from so, some old, like, communist Russian sympathizers who'd gotten tired of Russia and now were on to China. Mm. As a, I mean, but there was a big... There were people in New York, there were people, a lot of people in California. It was becoming an, I mean, it was a national organization that was interested in diplomatic relations and, you know, just furthering that relationship and hoping to find something in China that would be better than that was what was going on in the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, part of that's, we were rather idealistic, but we were... That's what we were looking. For. I mean, we were would look at we would look at socialism. We were. I mean, we were all considered ourselves communists or socialists or certainly not capitalists. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had seen some bad things and still are, um, unfortunately. 
but uh, about the U.S. Now, you know, we were also kind of naive, but so they invited us and two people from this local chapter to go on this trip to China, mm -hmm. and they needed Southerners, and so we were about the only chapter. The Chinese invited the national organization to put together a trip. And that national organization needed Southerners, so David Nolan and I were chosen to go to China on this trip in 1974. It was just two years after Nixon, and nobody could get to China. I mean, it was like, whoa. So, and we had to go through, we couldn't go directly to China, we had to go through, what's that little Portuguese, Kowloon? Anyway, we had to go, know the name of it. We had to get into China through this Portuguese way and go into Guangzhou. And then we were completely hosted by the Chinese and had a, an amazingly, amazing, amazing trip. Now, we saw what China offered us to see, mm -hmm. of course. And what we saw probably was as much the negation of the U.S., I mean, we just saw, well, this isn't like the U.S., so it must be good, uh, as we saw China. But we did also see China, and we're, we were very impressed at that point. Uh, we went to Beijing. We were impressed like tourists are impressed at the things that the Chinese workers had accomplished. Uh, and we were also impressed with things like... Uh, we came back and put together slideshows where things like how China solved its social problems. Now, <laughs> and we went to schools and we went to TV on TV and, you know, the status of, they were very concerned with the status of women. I mean, mm -hmm. so we did, my slideshow was all about the advancement of women in China and, um, which they were making a big effort with, really. I mean, the, the old and there were still lots of women who had their feet bound by when we were there, older women. So China was trying to move from feudalism into a more modern society. Now when we were there it was all bicycles, they were all wearing uniforms. Mao was still alive, he mm -hmm. died that same year. I think he died the same year we went, or he might have died this in 76, I can't remember, either 74 or 76. Uh, um, and we did not meet him, but David later went back and met Deng Xiaoping, who came after China. But I guess they thought that we had some power in this country, because don't ask me why we, we were the ones chosen to go. But we all went, had an amazing time, came back convinced that China was had a lot to offer, um, went around and did a lot of talking about it. Like around the country or? Yeah, around the country, a lot around Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And people were very interested because they knew nothing about China and the Chinese knew nothing about us. Oh my gosh, it's like we became a, a huge tourist attraction. If we were on a, they hadn't seen Westerners in years, years. Uh, and so we would get off a bus and we would be surrounded by we have some pictures, just, it seemed like thousands of people who would just come real close and like, just look at us. Mm -hmm. One, we were dressed, they were all in these, you know, mouth suits, all gray, all dressed. Uh, and we were all in these clothes and looked funny and talked funny and smelled funny. And I mean, we, wherever we went, People just like mobbed, almost mobbed us, because they were so curious about us too. Um, and we visited factories, and we visited schools, and we visited hospitals, and they were doing a lot in those social issues to try to bring the Chinas up from a, you know, a really back, very, very backward country, mm -hmm. um, and made some big mistakes, but. Uh, that's what we saw. Uh, and did you travel throughout we, a lot of the well, country? Well, we did. We traveled. We went to Be Be Beijing. We went to Shanghai. 
which was, a, it was in decline. I mean, it's not like it is now, but it was a beautiful city because it had been an old European city. I mean, where they had in the parks, no dogs or Chinese allowed. I mean, the Chinese had been very ill-treated by their own country. I mean, by not their own country, but by others and by Chiang Kai-shek and allowing all that. But anyway, um, yeah, we were in Shanghai, beautiful city. I mean, part of the day it wouldn't have hot water and things like that, but we even romanticized that. They're saving the hot water so everybody gets hot water. <laughs> we fed, incredible, and then we learned later that the Chinese would just keep bringing food until you just quit eating. So we would eat. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, it was an amazing trip. We were certainly not on our own to wander around. And we were taken to the stores where foreigners were taken and things like that. But we came back in an, in, in an effort. This The OL, this goes back to the OL, but the OL, you know, had tried to proletarianize itself so they would become part of the working class so they could make the revolution in this country. Well, before I went to China, we decided, I guess I did too, that I should also, since I was going to go see a lot of factories, I should go work in a factory beforehand. Now, it, you know, so I went to work at Sophie May Peanut Brittle Factory. Did you ever see that on? You're too young. There was, it was on, I think it was on North Avenue forever. And I think it only went out of business recently. I used to buy it whenever I'd see it in like Target or Pet Kmart or something. And so I went to try to proletarianize myself, which did certainly not take, but <laughs> by working in this factory at Sophie Mae Pinot Brittle, I was living with David by that point, and I would come home just, oh, I have my shoes would be like, I'd be like six feet tall with just peanut brittle all over <laughs> me. And them. But David would drive by and I'd go, mm. it was, I just learned that that's not what I, I didn't want to be a working class person mm. necessarily. But anyway, that was one of the requirements. That, so I was able then to see the Chinese factory. And because that was a big value of the Chinese, where they, during, unfortunately, during the Cultural Revolution, which got way out of hand. But the theory was that the intellect, this is supposed to be a working class country. I mean, we're doing it for the working class who produce all the goods and do all the work. So you take the intellectuals and you send them out to experience what it's like to be a, the peasantry in China. And it's your education. And you consider it an education now, mm -hmm. as you know it turned into not a good practice because all these crazy punks and people persecuted. And there was a lot of cruelty toward intellectuals, a lot of lives destroyed. I mean, but the theory, I always wished in my high school that the principal would have to go back and be a teacher for a year. I mm -hmm. thought that would be very good for him. Mm -hmm. So I understood the theory, but you know, it got way out of hand and turned into a bad thing. Um, How long did you work in the factory before you... I worked about six months. Now, some people worked in the OL. You know, the OL, when they decided to become the OL, and it was a lot of our friends, um, they just, well, I guess they'd been meeting secretly and everything because you couldn't trust anybody. Because what was it, beforehand? Well, this was the October League. I don't. It was people from the Bird and people from the Left, and was there something? There was another organization that was sort of a competing one, um, which Miller still is part of the RCP, right? The Revolutionary mm -hmm. Communist Party, which seems sort of passe to me by now. But anyway, the OL took all these people, regular middle class or even well-educated people. And they formed, they formed the OL. I don't know what it was, if there was, it might have been some, somebody could tell you who was in the OL. But, and they all like just disappeared one night from their friends. And they all moved over to the working class part of Atlanta and started eating like white bread and bologna so that they could like relate to the working class. I mean, they'll, all, they'll probably all get mad at that. 
But, I mean, it seemed sort of artificial. Only the only thing that wasn't artificial, and they would become known by secret names, like the country music lady, or so that you know, you, they if they were if their phones were tapped or something, they wouldn't get rounded up and, as communists. They had these cell meetings, and you know these six people would be in the cell, and they wouldn't know these big so you couldn't round up the whole organization, all kinds of things like that. I mean, the situation did not quite seem so dire here, but they, if you wanted to make the revolution, this is how. You, but the one thing that they really did was they went to work in factories, mm -hmm. and they were some of them worked there for. I mean, there's a, a woman who settled in St. Augustine after she'd been here. I knew her here, and now she's in St. Augustine. She worked at Nabisco for 25 years, 30 years. I mean, she proletarianized herself, and mm -hmm. now she gets a great pension, and she's doing fine. <laughs> and tried to unionize and tried to work in those factories. And David worked at Nabisco. He's just a complete intellectual, very shy. And I think he just read books between, you know, putting the, the biscuits or things in boxes. And, but also you had to sell this newspaper. It was called The Call. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen copies of it? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Okay. The headline would be, Dictatorship for the Proletariat Now. And that would be, <laughs> you'd say, this, does this really relate to the work? And you'd have to sell it out li outside of Atlantic Steel. Or something. Uh -huh. I mean, I cannot imagine how it's a hard sell. got beat up or so. But it was a hard sell. And it, the whole thing seemed, I mean, I actually, because I was with David, I did go to some study courses and I probably learned some things. But mostly I had to criticize myself for being a petty bourgeois pleasure seeker. I mean, it wasn't rock and roll and it wasn't, no, but. That goes back and reminds me of all the good country music writing that Gene Guerrero did on the bird. But anyway, uh, that was a funny time, I thought. What, what year do you think roughly? All this was happening? I tried to ask Bob Goodman, because I had forgotten about him, but uh, when did he say? He said before the bird... Oh, I do remember, before the bird was bombed, a lot of those people were already in the OL because a lot of those people did not support the bird. I mean, it wasn't a Marxist, it wasn't the call, right? It wasn't a Marxist-Leninist organization. It was way too newsy. It was, look at the graphics. I mean, it was, you know, what is this? Even though they'd been on the bird, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that had been their own education. But... Um, when the bird was firebombed, I do remember specifically one person named Jim Skillman that you probably won't interview because he wasn't ever on the bird, but he did make a big effort. And my sister actually married him, but it always made me feel very tender toward him too. The bird was destroyed, so he crea he made himself a light table, and a light table was one of those things where you cut out corrections. You know, there's a light underneath and you put the copy on it and you have a razor blade and if you're proofing it, you cut out a correction and then you put the correction back in, which is what we did the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and so he presented us with a, a light table. And Bob Goodman said there was also some support from the OL, but for the bird. But mostly they thought we were not going to make the revolution like they were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and when you said that a lot of people moved to the working class part of town, what part of town was that? Well, I'm trying to remember where it was. I guess, uh, to tell you the truth, was West End, was that black? Now, there was an effort to yeah. certainly have black, you know, unionize, integrate. Uh, I would have to find out because I st still stayed in. I didn't join the OL and lived always in Midtown Atlanta, which during those years, you know, was in decline and really cheap. That's where we all lived. Mm -hmm. the coffins ended up at the house. Have you seen the Coffins house? Mm -mm. Oh my gosh, you have to go see it. Yeah, it I've belongs heard. in the Smithsonian mm -hmm. or something. 
It's such great folk art. Very talented people. But anyway, I don't know. Where would they have moved? You'll have to ask somebody who talks about that mm -hmm. to you. I'm sure, are they open about it? But I don't know. Because they weren't then. Right, now. So I don't know if they are now. But it seems like it's been a long time. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm giving away any secrets, I hope. Um, so after U.S.-China People's Friendship Association, which w went on several years, oh, I, did I tell you then that the Chinese gave us the right to organize trips to China? I mean, it was incredible. I don't know why, but anyway, they gave us, and our local chapter would have like three trips a year. And so we would have this committee that would interview and all kinds of people. I mean, everybody was dying to go to China. Nobody could go to China. And here we were, just mm -hmm. these <laughs> punks or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> but so we would have these people um, sit and you'd come in a table. You might be a chair of a department at the University of Georgia. And you'd come in and the, one of the, you'd talk a while and then you'd say, now what is your position on the Taiwan question? And if they didn't answer that Taiwan, that China, Taiwan was a part of the People's Republic of China. Sorry, that was a, that was too. Mm -hmm. Disqualified. <laughs> they, they were disqualified. <laughs> but I, I mean, the Chinese felt pretty emphatic about that too, but I'm sure. But no, a lot of people went to China through us. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's just incredible, amazing. And they had the U.S. China People's Friendship Association national officers back after Mao died to meet with Deng Xiaoping, um, which was a, and David went on that, I did not, but there's an Atlanta magazine there's, from the Journal Constitution, there's actually an old magazine that has the cover story on the U.S. China People's Friendship Association and that its trip, but we are all on the cover, you know, at the Great Wall or something like that. And it's, that's worth looking up because it's just so, to me, it's like just amazing that yeah. we were allowed to do that and send people to China. And then China did, and we also worked hard on um, pushing diplomatic relations. And so was the American government at that point too, I think. Mm. I mean, after Nixon's trip and it was opening up. And, and would you do push opening up diplomatic relations by essentially lobbying or just we were through lot, educational we, efforts? What we, this local chapter did was we had a huge conference where we had Chinese scholars. I mean, we were trying to be the opposite of ultra-leftist at that point. I mean, we really wanted to achieve diplomatic relations, and that came from the ground up, but also it came from elected officials and I mean, people who had some power to do that. So we did have a big conference here. Um, what year? I don't know. 75, maybe? I don't know, because we moved in 76, so it was before then. Um, and I can't tell you all the names, but I mean, pe some people could. I mean, David Nolan could for sure, or other people who were in the U.S. I don't know that there are other bird people who are in U.S. China. Because how many people do you think were in, involved actively? Here? Or yeah. in the whole country? Here at the Atlanta. Oh, well, I mean, if we would have a program, a, hundred, a lot of people would come. Mm -hmm. And we would be invited to be on TV and because nobody knew anything about China. The schools would have us in there. Like the Atlanta public schools? Yeah, the Atlanta... But, was it Atlanta Public Schools? I'm sh I don't know, but I know all the private schools did. I remember. Mm. What's the name of the school down on Ponce de Leon that's kind of unconventional? Padilla. Padilla. We were at Padilla. Uh, 
several times. I mean, they, they might have even had a whole little series. And we were on the, I mean, they covered the conference, the news cover, they put us on the cover of the Atlanta, I mean, the Journal Constitution magazine. Uh, does the Atlanta Journal, is it still the Journal Constitution or is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we got a lot of publicity just because you couldn't go there. And how many, but like how? Oh, how many people would act core. more actively members? Mm, I don't know, 40? Okay. Yeah. There's always some more activist group within any organization, mm -hmm. but yeah. I mean, and was anybody paid for that work? I might, I was thinking if I was paid to organize the trips. If so, very little, and maybe not at all. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, some things are kind of embarrassing to me, but we would also make all the people, offer them, but that was required, to go to this orientation that we conducted. And I think, oh my gosh, there are probably all these China scholars and everything. I mean, <laughs> But they did, mm -hmm. and they went, and yeah. But then again, yeah, you all had something. actually been there. That's true. It's true. More recently than anyone else had. I know, so. but I remember it as a more <laughs> humble person today than then. Yeah, sure. <laughs> then in those days we knew everything. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. Then we moved. Then David and I moved back. To in '76, we had a baby. I mean, whose first birthday was celebrated back in St. Nogue. We actually, at that point, the left was very splintered, fighting each other, not real pleasant. The OL and the RCP. I mean, it, it was just falling. The war had ended. Um, legally, civil rights had been. One, now, we know where we are today, but, I mean, the legal part of it, the equal rights, had been signed. Um, so, mm, the issues were different. China had diplomatic relations. Not, not yet, really. But uh, it was just, it was not pleasant anymore. It wasn't that fun place anymore. There'd been so many splinter groups and who would rather fight each other over Trotsky versus Lenin or I mean, who, what? Mm. But uh, so we moved back to, David decided he was going to write a book and we moved back to St. Augustine. We, our family had a little beach house at Crescent Beach which is about 10 miles south of St. Augustine. So David and I moved there for not that long, six months until we bought a house in St. Augustine. Just a little, we didn't have much money, but we'd saved enough, mostly David had saved enough from working at Nabisco, really, mm -hmm. to put a down payment on a house. I think it was 15,000. No, it was, when we looked at it, it was 17,000, okay? And we were, we weren't sure we could afford it because it was over 15 or something. So we, but we wanted to offer them more because it was, we didn't know how to buy it because we really wanted it. I mean, it was a great house. It was not quite downtown, but downtown. And my father stepped in and said, no, that's not it. I'll offer them 15 and they'll still take it, which they did. So we bought our first house for $15,000 in St. Augustine. And have gone from there, yeah. Well, I, I want to follow follow that line, um, but I wanted to check back with a couple things about the bird. Um, I guess what, in your years of involvement, so I guess sixty late later sixty eight to seventy three ish. 72, 73? Yeah. Well, you Let's made it see. through Se the fire bombing. 70, that's right. It must have been probably 73, and then we went to China in 74. So, But, I mean, Steve, 
Steve Weiss can tell us the exact date. <laughs> right. By looking at the staff box. But yes, around, it would have to be, we did go to Juniper Street. I did go to mm -hmm. Juniper Street and left sometime. And then it carried on a while. I mean, I don't, and then I moved too pretty soon after that. Mm -hmm. Well, in your years while you were working working on the on the bird um was there a vision of of what you hoped that the the paper would be a purpose that it was it was serving personal ideals that were being fulfilled through your participation um i, I did really i felt very proud of being on the bird yeah um Certainly, we covered the most progressive movements of the day in a way that were never that were not covered by anybody else and by participants. So we covered the whole. Now, I was never one of the heavy duty writers. I mean, if I go back and look what I wrote, I, I mean, I wrote a lot of the women's stuff, and but um, yeah. We wrote about the women's movement. We wrote about the gay liberation movement. We certainly wrote about racism and the black liberation movement. Um, the war, lots about the war. Um, yeah, and about personal, I mean, there was also that, there was sort of a split all the time about culture versus politics. I mean, and sometimes that got real antagonistic. And Miller got caught up in that, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, he's a brilliant writer on music, movie criticism, but I don't know why the antagonism exactly. But anyway, yes, I think in my own goals, uh, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I feel very good about my years on the bird, and certainly for my own personal education, I developed a world view mm. that I still have today mm -hmm. about what's important, about what food you eat, about why, why you want to get rid of pesticides, a, a little bit about the environmental movement. I've gotten to be much more of an environmentalist mm -hmm. than I was then, much, much, much more. Because China's position then was oh, the more pollution, you know, it just shows we're getting to be a rich country like the U.S. So quit talking to us about that environment. But no, I think that's probably one of the number one issues of the day, really, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is our environmental issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, and we made, oh, the other thing is internally, I mean, we really knew, we didn't know how to do do anything really. So we became so democratic that, I mean, everything was decided in meetings of everybody. Everything. I mean, eight hour meetings, if it had to be. Mm -hmm. What I were mean, they so, like? Huh? Well, I, you know, I found them fascinating. I'm sure I'm, I see some of the pictures of us in those meetings and we're all like, but I mean, it was, I don't know, I, I found the whole, I couldn't say anything bad really about the bird or my time there at all. I mean, because it was so, it worked hard for its own ideals. I, I do think so. It wasn't perfect and people and were mean to each other and had, you know, big differences of opinion and left mad maybe some. And, but it was, it seemed like it would, it, it's like families who are good families or marriages who are good marriages, you work at it. I mean, it doesn't just have, and I think the bird really made an effort to live its ideals. I do. And we didn't know what we were doing. And it came out, I mean, what, it was the largest weekly in Atlanta for how many years? I don't know, two or three at least. And all those guys they did, I don't know if women did it, that drove that bird all over the place to get printed. I mean, somebody told me, was it Steve Wise and Bob Goodman drove it once to New Orleans to get printed because we didn't have a printer here? Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody would print us. 
and they arrested our sellers? I mean, oh yeah, there was some ultra-leftism besides the OL too, because, you know, a lot of us were, I mean, the bird went through different phases of who was influencing things, because we had some, that one cover of come and get it, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That I think they arrested our sellers during that period for profanity um, and really harassed us. And Jean had to go defend. I remember going to court and hearing Jean defend our doing that. And I know he must have been opposed because he was never an ultra leftist. But that. And they also, I think they arrested our sellers for abortion ads, too. I'm not sure of that. But, I mean, our sellers got in trouble quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very worthwhile, and I, I do think it did a lot. I, I believe I'm right on this, that Sam Michelle, that's another reason. I think when he campaigned much later in his career for something, or maybe it was earlier, he had a copy of the bird on his table there. I mean, people were proud to read the bird. People mm -hmm. were proud to be associated with the bird. And we had a lot of older people. I call them older people. I'm quite older now, but uh, who wrote for us columns. And I mean, yeah, the bird was, I think, a force in the city. Yeah, and the the region and, and national region. And the region. It was, and maybe subscriptions nationally. were shared I, yeah. with other I think so. It was that papers. whole it was that whole time. Mm -hmm. I mean it was a nice time to be young. <laughs> you got to break a lot of rules too. Mm -hmm. Now you know, here we are today. So we ended one war. I think I would think we helped with the effort, with that mass movement that really did help in the Vietnam War, and a mass movement that helped um, restore rights to people who deserved them. I mean, to the African Americans in this country, legal rights. Um, so, and furthered the women's movement, and I think we were part of all those things. How effective we were, I, who knows, but. How did how did race affect the work at the bird that you as you saw it? It's hard because you know it's pretty white. Mm -hmm. uh, affect the what the work of the bird? Yeah, or just the, the the like it's clear that we were white. Yeah. And, but interested in and covering a lot of issues that affected and were of concern to... I guess that was our role, because mm -hmm. we certainly weren't, we weren't taking direction from... I mean, I don't know if you asked a black person if they read The Bird, I don't know if they would say yes, or if they were more involved in SNCC, or certainly the other movements. Mm -hmm. going on at the time. So I, I don't, can't answer that. It's white people who were supportive of the black movement. Yeah. And I, I know people who had worked in civil rights uh, on the bird, I think. And you talked about the emerging women's movement and, and the ways that gender certainly played played out. Um, we never had to deal with racism in that way because they weren't the black people that weren't there to confront us or point out that mm -hmm. all this had a white bias or whatever were the legitimate criticisms because you know there were some. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're all we're just tainted with a white bias or whatever it is that we're, I hope, we're getting better. But boy, it's certainly just 
crawling out from horrible places these days, isn't it? All that racism just oozing out. Ugh. Mm -hmm. So distressing. Do you recall who some of the the women that were involved in the what I've heard referred to as the women's caucus of putting out that that first issue and then I'd like to look at the step. I well I mean I know the stand I know for sure Stephanie and Linda and me and Nan, I'm sure. Uh, and I'm trying to think who Linda Bibbon. I mean I'm just trying to think of the women I can think of that were working on the bird. Mm -hmm. Uh and there were some women that I didn't know as well or keep up with as well. And I don't know at what... I would have to look back at that. I wish I had looked at that issue before I came to this interview. I meant to, which I did very little. Uh, mm, I think any woman who was involved in the bird at that time was in that caucus. Um, and there was a lot of shared understanding that came out of that caucus and a lot of accusations and a lot of tears and I mean it was it was a time when people did sort of confront each other uh, but in a way that I think was resolved to bond those people and maybe a, too much of the enemy was been, I, my own mother I tried to involve in the women's movement and finally she said you know I don't want to read all that because I don't want to be mad at George all the time, which, <laughs> which she could have been, but I mean, it's a different time and mm -hmm. she'd lived a good life and had a good... Do you recall, did, did that meeting come together? I wish I could think of how it all did come together. In sort of a way, like... So where a couple women are <laughs> at layout and sort of talking about these things and people decide, like, let's hold a meeting to... Well, I do think it came out probably as part of an emerging movement. I mean, we were affected. We probably weren't the first people in the world who had that women's caucus. It was probably happening simultaneously. And as you read other newspapers or read lots of magazines or... Mm, you thought, yeah, I mean, that's true. They don't help, and we don't get paid, and we are doing everything. And <laughs> we have to, sh I mean, you know, I stopped shaving my legs, right, and shaving my underarms, because mm -hmm. why should I? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I mean, and those are small things, but of course, the inequality in pay, I mean, the larger issues too, not just the ones that affected us as sort of middle class women. I mean. Did you become involved in a, in a wider women's movement? Yes, I think probably a lot of people did. In the same way that people are involved in book clubs now. Mm -hmm. I think book clubs are like such a healthy movement all over the country. Uh, and I think there were gatherings of women some went politically, some were just personal, some were like supporting people going through the divorce. I mean, I think, but I think they were very prevalent. I mean, I, I know of several that just came out of all the birth stuff. So I do think women got together as women. Mm -hmm. Were you in consciousness raising groups? Consciousness or? raising groups, absolutely. Yes. I mean, mm hmm. And I think, I think it was Stephanie that told me about, I think it was named the Atlanta Women's Movement and that there was a house over on Briarcliff, maybe? That was for abused women or something? I, I don't know. No, I think it was like a... A place you went? You yeah, know? that was just the space for... Women to get together. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's possible. Yeah. I don't remember it, but yeah. I think there was, I, I think it had a huge impact. What did it do for you personally? Raise my consciousness. <laughs> it did. I mean, I think it made me a much stronger person. It made me feel much more solidarity with 
women. Um, it, it, it made me a lot stronger and able to see that you could stand up. I, could, I became a writer. I became much more of a writer then. Um, it made me some awful good friends, too. I mean, yeah. It, I, there's just such a bond between women now, I think, that it was, it was probably always there. I don't know. I mean, in society, I'm sure women got together years back when they did the wash together and stuff like that, too. But, yeah, I think the women's part was vitally important. Mm. If, I don't know if it was more of a white woman's movement. I mean, if it's, I know there was an effort to spread out. I presume it did. I don't know. Uh, the race question is one that's, they were just, it was white women. Mm -hmm. And primarily white working class women, I mean white middle class women, except for those who were trying to pro proletarianize themselves. <laughs> so. And what about sexuality in that piece? Yeah. I don't, have, do you have that, did you read that issue? I, I would like to go back and read it. I mean, sexuality was a bird, big part of being at the bird. I mean, I don't know how one talks about all that now, but there was a very, or part of a, a world beyond the bird, too. I mean, part of the whole Atlanta community or the 60s or whatever that era is called, I think, sexual liberation, if you want to see it as a good thing, um, I think was very much a part of the whole 60s and 70s and the pill was available and there weren't all these that I know of, there weren't all these uh, other sexual diseases around. I mean, it seems so sad now that people have to talk about disease the first conversation you have about sex. I mean, we were so free, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. We'd conquered pregnancy, I guess VD and those diseases. You could get penicillin. Yeah. I mean, they weren't, they didn't seem. So it was a period of sexual liberation that I certainly don't think was harmful to me. I don't know what other people would say. How did you see, see that sort of playing out? Like if sexual liberation was such a, a component, what, what did it look like? <laughs> <laughs> it looked like that sex could be part of a I mean, I especially experienced it in traveling in Europe because when you travel, you make these intense relationships that are short term. But you, I mean, you have those converse, deep conversations and you get to know somebody and you know you're going to see them again, which you never do. And you spend this time and you, I don't know, you hang out at the Paris cafes for those times and you discuss Sard or, I mean, something and whatever, and, and you become sexually involved. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Munich, and you leave that person, and you think you're going to meet up, and you were so in love, but it's love for a month. I mean, and that's, I mean, for me that was a very free period. I don't want to use the word promiscuity because I don't want it to seem like that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I yeah. felt rather sexually free mm -hmm. and had so much fun and no regrets. Mm -hmm. Now I've met my, I have sisters-in-laws who have, are very proud that they weren't involved in that, that they were so I know pe different people feel very differently about all that. And I think then you grow up or, I mean, you make certain, after you make certain commitments, you've done that. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't see it going on into marriage or I don't advocate 
that. I think it can be very damaging too. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? At the I bird and the see, surrounding well, community? Like I saw a little of that. I mean, I saw some, I guess, do you call them affairs if somebody's married? I, don't, I mean, I saw some sex that even then didn't seem appropriate if you were married. I mean, it seems like if you want to do that, either get out of a marriage. I mean, unless both partners are willing, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw some sexuality affect in a bad way some marriages. And I think that's, in my view, it, is da it would be damaging. To have affairs or largely through made a betrayals to, yeah I mean I don't think I myself would not be involved in that kind of situation nor marry anybody who would advocate that so maybe I think it has to be a certain time of life I don't know but you don't you aren't making those commitments and you haven't had children I mean I think a lot of us had a long youth I mean, I didn't marry till I was 30. Mm -hmm. So you had a long youth. If you got married at 21, I mean, different. On that point, what was it like to be a single person at the bird? Because so many of the foundational members That's true. were couples. It's true. Um, and you talked about, when talking about... Uh, women at the bird and competitive mm -hmm. feelings among women. That, that's and a good point. I do think those those powerful couples had power to being a couple. They also had limitations because they had families. I mean they had they were not free. They were not part of the sexual revolution. They were not I mean, I'm glad I was a single person at the bird. Mm -hmm. I think I had a lot more fun. But <laughs> I may, I might not feel that way if I had been Stephanie and Tom. Who, mm -hmm. But it was hard on those marriages. That sexual rebel, uh, not sexual, women's movement was hard on marriages. Could be. I mean, those strong marriages stayed together. But, I mean, there was a lot of bad talk about men. <laughs> And you could get mad at your husband for things that were just part of the times. And, I mean, yeah, and, and some I, of the I, relationships didn't survive. Exactly. Those strong ones did. I mean, I really respect Tom and Stephanie. I mean, because, I mean, they were bringing up two little kids. And in an odd environment. I mean, a very free environment. Mm hmm so they were around a lot of things now. I think they're both great kids. So, but no, I, I, um, I myself think it would be harder to have been the married people. Because I, one thing I really liked about the bird was just the complete freedom. So. Mm-hmm. During your years in Atlanta, and particularly at the Bird, um, what was your social life like, and what did you do for entertainment, time? free time? I don't know. There was just always something, and you know, even at the Bird, I always had boy. I always had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like. I mean. Well, there was so much. I mean, there was good music everywhere. The Almond Brothers were playing in Piedmont Park. I feel like the bird, I mean, I always claim the bird discovered the Almond Brothers. But I, I don't know that it's really true. But, I mean, there was good music. There was good, there was political stuff going on all the time that seemed exciting. There was putting out the bird once a week. I mean, you were part of this group that was just like, energetic. I mean, there was, if you wanted to do something, you could do something in, all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
And there were a lot of young, I mean, there were young people around. It was a real young, energetic world that we lived in. It was a close community. We got so we uh, ate, you know, there were a lot of people who would get together and eat together. And some night, part of that time, what years were these? Uh, I mean, we ate together every night. And I remember Gene, he discovered Spam. <laughs> no, some of us, that's right, some of us were making so little money that we really did qualify for free food, whatever mm -hmm. that is, whatever that program is. And, boy, you got, you got a big thing of butter, and that was, like, fabulous. What else did you think? You got a big thing of like some kind of processed cheese, and that was disgusting. And you got a big thing of spam, I remember that. <laughs> and that was also disgusting. But Jean became an expert in spam recipes. <laughs> and I'm not sure he survived many of those eating co-ops for very long. <laughs> Because there was so much of it around. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of that happened too. A lot of people would get together, six people or seven people or ten or whatever, and you would eat together, some four times a week, some. And we all lived pretty much in close proximity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, within walking distance. So you participated in them? Oh, many of those, yeah. I've also heard of of several living arrangements where bird folks oh, yeah. were living together and also intentional communal living. Um, did yeah. you ever live in any of I those? I did, I did. I lived in two of them. Whew. Um, yeah, those were interesting too. The first one, it's funny because can't even sometimes remember who all was involved in which. Uh, yeah, I would say they all worked sort of. <laughs> and when I was in, you haven't interviewed Ann Jenkins because she lives somewhere. I think she really, she went out to work. Okay, where was that house? I can't even tell you, but it was in the neighborhood. It was like on Piedmont or Juniper or one of those, a, a small a small house that we called the Heathen Rage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. Who was in there? I don't... I, I can't remember who all. I know that I was and Miller was and it was Joe Rogers, who was kind of a straight person. Was Harvey? Who else was in there? Uh, I I can't. It's terrible. I cannot tell you. And um, I would say they only work pretty well. And you know, Miller was married, too, to K.M. Forget that. I mean, he was obviously gay, but he was married the whole time we were on 14th Street. I have to, I wish I could think of, I wish I could remember. Sorry, I don't remember who will. You could probably tell me after. What did they say about the human rights? I think just the... It existed. I, I think whoever it was, it might have been Steve. Oh yeah, it might um, have been. That that was just saying like that there were some communes around the people. Oh, that's right. Them. Because Ann Jen Steve was with Ann Jenkins, and Ann Jenkins was one who sort of went out and made money and supported the place. Mm. Um. Did Steve live there too? I, I can't I don't remember. Recall. You know, I don't, if I don't remember, you probably. Know. Then there was another one on Ponce de Leon um, that was later. And again, I would say, 
um, there was always some tensions, I think, in those, maybe because the people who chose to live in, oh gosh, I was with another one, you know, I, actually, I lived with Charlie Cushing in a house one time, not with him, we were not a together person, but, yeah. Did either of those have names, the houses? I don't think that had a name. I think that was just sort of, it wasn't so intentional. It's just that there was this house and it had these rooms and we lived there. And mm -hmm. that was probably more peaceable than the ones who were intentional. Mm -hmm. Because the little ones who are intentional, you take your good friends or people you're, you're um, with romantically or... To me, they just seem more volatile in a way than just living together as people who aren't as involved with each other. Mm. And the Charlie Cushing one was not as involved with each other. Mm. Who I can't remember who else lived there besides him. Maybe this woman named Harvey, a little girl. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of drama in those <laughs> arrangements. Do you think that was the biggest drawback of them? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was kind of cool for people to be able to live together. Mm -hmm. I mean, but there was the sexual revolution going on, <laughs> people who smoked dope. I mean, I remember one. Oh, where was that? guy named Phil Weldon. I mean, he was so afraid that people would break into the house and we would be raided for marijuana that he put up this big, like, bar that came down and you couldn't break down the door. I mean, so there was all that kind of stuff going on. I don't know. There's just, to me, a, you want a sort of home that is maybe more peaceful than those things. That's the way I feel about the ones I lived in, except for maybe the Charlie Cushing one. As, as I remember, that was more just three or four people who rented a house together just mm. out of convenience because none of us had much money. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember that we ate communally or took turns doing all that. Then there's, there's all the problems about, you know, the communal room that's not cleaned and do you put your chores up on a little piece of paper and who buys the groceries and whose turn is it to cook and I mean all that can get more complicated than with that living arrangement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think it might be nice to get old like that, I don't know. Rather than, I mean, certainly not go to an old folks' home, but just get your best friend. I live on these this little tiny street on St. Augustine where there are these eight little cute houses and they're all real close to each other. Um, and I married my neighbor, and so we have two houses. We each have a house that we live in on that street. Mm. <laughs> and it's like so perfect. So you live in one and he lives right next door still? Yeah, he, well, the street is, I don't know if you've ever been to St. Augustine, but it has little tiny streets, and this is, these are cute little eight bungalows that are right, and I live across the street from him, and we just, it's like the road is sort of our living room. I mean, we, and you know all your neighbors very mm -hmm. well, because we're right on top of each other, um, but we're, we all have outside porches, and I mean, mm -hmm. I, I love it, um, but that seems like a good place to get old. Yeah, it seems me. like a nice arrangement. And it's a great arrangement for a second marriage. I mean, once you're already settled, I mean, my house is so, to me, it's just perfect. It's kind of pristine, and it's it's not so cluttered. And, and he is a big, he's sort of a, uh, he likes tons of stuff, sort of a hoarder a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it would be impossible, it would have been impossible for us to live. But we sleep at his house and eat breakfast at his house and read the Times and do that, and then... Really, all my clothes and everything are at my house. Mm -hmm. And then we entertain and have dinner and that at my house. And it just works very well. Yeah. No, I've, I've heard of 
I know. It Several people that do this. Oh, really? Yeah. And it mm -hmm. completely makes sense. It does. Now. And the older I get and the more. Well, that's it. I mean, when you're young, you, I mean, when you have children and all that, you live together and you build bonds that way. And I mean, there's a certain. And financial necessity and. Yeah, all that. But. So. Oh, is there life after? Um, I also wanted to, to follow up. You mentioned the police sting or roundup of folks at the at the 14th Street house and then um, the arrest on the New Jersey Turnpike. Mm -hmm. Were there any other arrests for activism or being oh, yeah, involved there, in the definitely bird? Definitely there were. I mean, that's how I really got involved with David Nolan, my first husband, is we were covering the meat strike, and he got arrested for, you know, like, um, crossing the street in the road. What do you call that? Um, Jaywalking? Jaywalking, or something like that. And so we covered that. I mean, yeah, there were some arrests. What? Uh, I don't know that any of them came to anything. I mean, I don't think that the bird was like, it wasn't a place where people like shot up drugs or it was like a place that some marijuana was smoked and and you were stupid if you kept it I mean if you weren't mm -hmm. kind of cool about that but I don't I can't think of any offhand but I'm sure there probably were some in terms of strikes or um, Oh, at maybe at demonstrations. I mean, at some of those Washington demonstrations, I remember people running through the streets, like smashing windows, just kind of on a crazy run down. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't remember anybody seriously going to prison. No, I don't. I think from what I've heard, no charge that was ever lodged against the bird. Held up. Yeah. No, it didn't. And I, and I by extension, I, I, I think, like, the people involved with the bird, yeah. like, nothing ever, there was not a big repercussion. Mm, I don't think so. You all covered, covered stories. Yeah, yeah. Of, of people. Of course. I mean, because prison reform, oh my gosh, don't we need that now? So. And what were your, you mentioned doing work in, in layout and advertising and a bit of writing, particularly around women. I also wrote other things. Oh no, I was trying to think, now what was I doing all the time? Uh, that's why I was always, always so hesitant because I would say to Stephanie, you, one, I can't remember, and two, what did I do? <laughs> uh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sure I did things like office manager. I think I put that there. I, I remember picking up all the mail and giving it to them. Uh, I'm sure I was useful. I mean, but... I did type, I mean, I did typing, but I, it wasn't as good as some of those being, oh my gosh, Miller and Bob Goodman, and Jink, and Ann Jenkins. I mean, they were just like fabulous type. I did a little editing. Um, I was always considered such a good writer in high school, but it was never like, it was more just lighthearted than mm. serious. And I did more and more writing after the bird. But I can't tell you what else I did. <laughs> How much time would you say that you spent? Oh, hours. At the bird. My life. Like weekly. Like oh, during the most intense parts of the bird? Uh, oh, you know, all day and all night if you wanted to. I mm -hmm. mean, but now I also had those jobs. I mean, I did work at the ACLU for years, too. But I bet that was like off and on. And 
I always had jobs. I really have a bad, I wish I had a better memory so I could tell you more specifically, but I don't. They all, it all just sort of runs into one big life. Yeah. But in those years, the bird was a... The bird was a focal essential, point. Yeah. Yes, it was. And so was the ACLU in a way. I mean, those jobs at the ACLU were really handy. And a lot of people worked at the ACLU, I think. Mm. So in 1976, okay, you moved Okay, that's you moved right. Oh, yeah. What happened St. Augustine. Do you have time for all this? What time do you have? It's approaching three. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah. And, and, and do you have time and, and energy still for it? Yeah. Okay. As long as you... Let me try to think here. Okay, so we moved back. David, my, we were married. We had this great wedding, this sort of Chinese wedding. Mm. <laughs> this was during the China period. At Atlanta Waterworks Park. And we have some funny pictures of people from the OL, even at our wedding, selling the call. I mean... Dictatorship of the proletariat now at our wedding. But anyway, we had a big, huge wedding. Very fun. Um, then we moved. We, we had a, I was pregnant when we moved back home, and that was in 76. I had a daughter, Sudi Arioshi Nolan, and she was named for a uh, Japanese friend of the Chinese Revolution, who a person who was a close friend of Joe and Lai. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, yeah, the Ariyoshi part, the Sudi part, who was named for my great aunt, who was a wonderful Southern educator, whose Sudi was born on her 81st birthday, so. Mm. And then I had, and she lives in Atlanta today with three kids of her own. Wow. She's married to a doctor at Emory, and she herself has a big job that contracts with the government. Way too much work. But mm. um, And then I had a son in 1979, Hamilton Nolan, that was both, who worked, I mean, he did a lot of things, but what was the most interesting to me is, really, is that he worked at Gawker.com. Mm. Do you know Gawker? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, which has some parallels to the bird. Not exactly, but, yeah until, I don't know if you followed Gawker, but he, you know, it went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Peter Thiel destroyed Gawker. Um, so Hamilton now is working for one of those other sites um, and is still in New York writing, so that's good. Has a, his, his partner, is his girlfriend, uh, they bought a house together, a co-op in Brooklyn, in a transitional neighborhood that they love, uh, and doing, you know, both my kids are great kids and doing well. Mm -hmm. um, so I went back, and David, my husband, was going to, and he should be interviewed too, although his thing wasn't the bird, but a brilliant guy who was around Atlanta too, mm -hmm. working in the political movement, joined the OL, worked at Nabisco for years. But anyway, we moved back, and the first job I got, he was going to write a book, and I was going to work, so... What was his book going to be on? Actually, it's funny, it was going to be on Florida history. He just changed, I mean, he was just through with this for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and he got it published. It was funny, Harcourt... Yavon, Harcourt Brace Yovanovitch. Yovanovitch was the guy who moved the headquarters of Harcourt Brace to Florida. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, it, I think that was in Orla to Orlando, I think, David just wrote him and said, welcome to Florida, are you interested in a book? And he wrote back and said yes. I mean, it was like one of those impossible things. So David wrote a book on Florida history that's called 50 Feet in Paradise, The Booming of Florida that's very interesting and got it published by Harcourt Brace. And we even did this publicity tour around Florida and everything. Um, and he still lives in St. Augustine. He's happily married and we're great friends, mm. which is what we should have been in the first place. But we have, I mean, we had... 
I still think he's a that a wonderful person. Yeah. And we have two great children together, and so it, that's all fine. And um, how long were you guys married? Let's see. We must have been married about fifteen years. Mm -hmm. um, and most of those, we had some good years. Very different people, but I mean that's a whole story. Just could never figure out how to resolve big differences. You might be able to now, but we couldn't then. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a job at this drug education center, and I was supposed to go around and teach school kids about the dangers of drugs. This was so, I mean, everybody laughed at me here. But it was all this printed curriculum. I never taught. I knew I didn't want to be a teacher when I was at Emory. I didn't want certified or anything. Um, and so I had this curriculum, and the first question would be, what is a drug? And then I was supposed to wait and let somebody go. And of course, it was like this total horrifying experience in a lot of ways, because nobody ever did that. They mm -hmm. just started talking to, you know, Alicia next to them. But for some reason still, I got a little better at it, and tur it turned out that I really enjoyed teaching. I mean, even out of that bad, horrible curriculum. So I became a teacher in the Catholic schools in St. Augustine because they didn't require me to be certified. I wasn't certified. I just sort of talked myself into the job, this nun that I really liked. It was a little Catholic school right in the middle of downtown, which I loved that. Um, and... Uh, the only thing I had to do as a concession for that job was change. I hadn't changed my name from Hamilton when I got married, mm -hmm. and they could not bear that. So I, I didn't care as much anymore. My kids were named Nolan, and I, my, so I changed my name. Mm -hmm. and they hired me, and I taught there for three years, and I really enjoyed teaching there. Uh, I was teaching lower grades then. But we were a downtown school, and we took all kind of field trips, and it was a lot of good discipline. You said the every 40 minutes you would say the Lord's, everybody would come into the class, you would stand up and say the Lord's Prayer, and then sit down. And I found out that, like, worked miracles because they settled down. I mean, the kids would come in, that's what they expected to do, say the Lord's Prayer, and then they sat down and, like, they were ready to work. When I moved to the public, I mean, it was hard to give up. Mm. I mean, I didn't believe the Lord's Prayer, but still it was like this great thing that kept kids just ready to go. And that was very fun, but paid a lot less. And after three years, I didn't have to go back, and I was sort of grandfathered in as being a teacher. So I didn't have to go back and do... I did have to take a few education courses or something. But... So I moved to the public schools, and I moved to, uh, uh, it was called Allen Nice High School, which was an international baccalaureate degree program mm -hmm. high school, excellent high school, not really in St. Augustine, it was out, that's the only thing I didn't like about it. It was served Ponte Vedra, which is like a rich golf community that's still in our county. So it was an easy school to teach in, very involved parents, very demanding parents, good teachers, good, I mean, I loved, I really loved it, even though it's still, and um, worked there for, until I remarried and retired. At, at 55, I married, um, David and I had been divorced for a long time, and I married an old family friend who is older than I, uh, he's 14 years older, so he's 85 and he's getting old, like we all are. Um, he was a director of the Marine Lab from the University of Florida, which was located near Crescent Beach. So it was right on the beach. I've known him for years. Again, we were neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, I never thought I'd marry again. And I thought that was fine, too. I had good friends. I had a full life. But I just felt so much in love. I mean, it was so much fun to do that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... We married, and I retired really because he spent every summer in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Do you know Cape Cod? Woods Hole is a scientific center in, in um, Cape Cod, 
where the theory was then, and still is, I guess, that scientists came from all over the world, really, for this lovely little town, and collaborate and a huge scientific center called the Marine Biological Laboratory, where they all collaborated. I mean, you worked with people who are working together. Now that's much easier to do with technology. But I mean, the culture was there. I, I, I mean, I love that place still because it's not any little precious town. It's like a real working scientific town, and they're all like people. They wear their Birkenstocks, and there's folk dancing, and I mean, it's like it's like that kind of kind of like an old fashioned. <coughs> wear funny socks and, and so we have a little house there still mm -hmm. four miles and there's beautiful bike trails it's really beautiful um, and he went, he would go for all summer and he did since he was like a postdoc or something wow. I mean so he had been going there a long time finally his he had been married his wife was killed in an automobile accident but they had bought just a little kind of shacky house four miles up the bike trail from Woods Hole. And we still have that house and we still go to Cape Cod. Um, I don't like to stay as long as he does because I don't have as much of a life. And I do, I go biking. I mean, it sounds just ideal. You go, I go biking and I go swimming, I go to the fish market. But then I'm sort of ready to come. I mean, I tried to uh, campaign for Elizabeth Warren, the Democratic Party didn't have any, I mean, they're going to get elected. You know, Obama, they didn't have any signs. I mean, Massachusetts was so liberal that there wasn't much political work to be done. Mm. Um, and I read, and I had a great time, but after about a month or six weeks, I'm sort of ready to come home. So, mm, but we did a lot of biking. We took a, took a lot of bike trips in Europe. Um, and also, I, what I became is a real neighborhood activist. I mean, I've been involved now in local politics since I've been back. Not running myself, but because I hate public speaking. I wish I didn't. Um, but um, supporting good candidates, uh, a mayor that we elected appointed me to set up an office in City Hall to establish neighborhoods and neighborhood associations. So we did that about, oh, probably 20 years ago, maybe. And now, I mean, we have very strong neighborhood associations. Um, and I was the president for like eight years. I mean, so. That's been my, and also very involved in trying to save our town from develop, our county from developers, which is, we're losing. Um, just awful, mm -hmm. terrible. They're just paving over North Florida now because we have a beautiful part of North Florida. I mean, where we have our little beach house is still just, it's almost pristine. We still have oyster leases and it's about 10 miles, but we're going to lose it fast. I mean, we used to be sort of, St. Augustine was a really pretty little town that people passed through on their way to Disney World or somewhere. But now it's become this destination and it's on every 10 best places and, and it's just, you can tell you're getting old when you remember how beautiful it was and what we have to lose and especially now with Trump. Um, you know, every restriction, every regulation, everything that keeps the oceans clean or going. And I have two brothers, one of which is in real estate in St. Augustine, whose whole thing is conservation land, though. And he, he has been successful in that part of the county. The, the northern part is gone. It's part of Jacksonville. But of keeping it pristine. I mean, that's been his whole work, and it's really nice. And now my whole extended family, who I'm a, I am adore, almost every person has come back to that place. So we all have little shacks, and we have a little fish, uh, did I already say, we have a little fish camp, and we have <laughs> kayaks, and yeah, my daughter's just bought a house there, and so it's a nice life. Yeah. Now Florida's in horrible shape. I mean, we have a horrible governor. My county, a Democrat, can't get elected. In fact, I've had to change my party affiliation to, 
because and they're closed primary, so everything's decided in the primary. And so we had one good candidate one time, and I actually changed to a Republican to vote for this person. And then I was so terrified I'd die, and it would be on my gravestone. She became a Republican. <laughs> so, but you know, Florida's not in great shape. Although we elected Obama, and we elected Clinton, and we elected Gore, really. Right. But <laughs> mm -hmm. so we haven't done so bad. Well, and this time we elected Trump. So. So, um, that's a pretty fast summation, but, and I still, you had a question, I still do keep up with people from The Bird. Mm. Oh, I do, I see the, the coffins were just down at my house recently because they were all going camping with some other friends, so they came and visited, uh, Jean and the coffins and Sutra, some other friends used to spend Christmas down at a, mm -hmm. a, a beach front house down there. They haven't done that for a long time. Uh, but And now that my daughter lives here, I'm actually here much more than I was. So I keep up with Bob Malone, who's just there. You haven't interviewed him yet. I mean, but I do, I mean, and it's funny because I still think of them because I moved when the bird was still going on. I still think of them as this little close community, which they're not at all. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's fun to visit Atlanta, because it's always fun to see the coffins. And Jean is in D.C., my brother's going up to, on a, the climate march and staying at Jean's house. And so, yeah, there are, they'd be hard to forget. Yeah. And I think that you've touched on this, but just to wrap up, so from this point, now approaching 50 years, um, 50 years since the you. since mm -hmm. the bird was founded, how do you how do you reflect back on that that time that period of your life? But in what way? I mean, more than I've said. In what I mean, just what sort of generally what does what does that mean to you that time? For me, it really means it, I really credit it. Again, I say this with. Um, my education. Mm -hmm. Emory, I can barely remember. I mean, I don't, I can, can barely think of a professor. I mean, the bird, I don't know, it's big, I guess because we did it and we developed a certain attitude towards change, a point of view, that I think people need to to develop. I mean, I don't think you stay, people will say you have to stay open-minded all your life or something. Well, kind of. I mean, you have to stay open to new ideas and that gets harder as you get older, or technology or whatever. But I do think that at some point you come to some conclusions about some things. And I think the bird helped me develop those conclusions and that I'm so glad about that. I'm glad I'm not living at Marsh Creek Country Club or playing golf all the time. I'm just so glad. Mm -hmm. And I think my parents, I think my whole life has contributed to that too. I would, but the bird was just such a highlight. And thinking about it, I, can, I mean, there's so many memories of when we talk about the pop festivals. I mean, there are two pop festivals here, right? And, did Steve Wise talk about those? Yeah, I think so. Oh, because there's a lot of nudity. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of memories here in Atlanta. So I just look back with great delight that I was part of all that. Yeah. And really, I can't think of one regret. Um, I even keep up, yeah, I keep up with old boyfriends that now are happily married and live in, and are just sort of liberals. And, but yeah, I do keep up with a lot of people from the bird mm -hmm. and would miss them a lot. Maybe not a lot, lot, but yeah. yeah. So I see it as one of the luckiest things that happened to me that I got to participate in. Mm -hmm. 
and I feel like I've had a, I mean, also it was just, it just gave me such joy. And I, I feel like I'm a person capable of great joy. So that was. <laughs> yeah. And we just did it. We didn't even know how to do it. How do we know how to do it? And it came out and it was so cool. I mean, I look back and I, I really shudder, of course, at some of the things one wrote. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's fun. But others are looking at it and are just so intrigued. Well, yeah. I mean, and well, so do I. I mean, it was the fun of youth, too, right? I mean, what better way to spend your youth? And, yeah. Meaningfully. Meaningfully. Yeah. You participated in the great movements going on. And I yearn for that for our, my own kids or my, the young people today. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, I don't know. Do you have kids? No. I mean, what are, well, you're relatively young. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think everybody looks back on their youth as probably a joyful time. I mean, I think being young in, it, in itself is probably a happy time for most people, I hope. Um, but that was something. Yeah, the, the conjuncture of time and place. It all came together, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and it does... A lot of times. It does but, a lot of but times. There is something and it could right now again. Something I particular feel like about Atlanta in in the sixty eight to seventy six. I think was, that's right. That's mm -hmm. so true. I'm hoping though that out of all what's happening now, that movement another movement may reemerge. May take a different form. I mean there's the technology, you know, is sort of foreign to me, but Somehow, that'll all produce something wonderful, I hope. Or Fingers crossed. I know. There does I mean, seem to, to be something in the air that hasn't been around. Yeah, it's something. In my lifetime. I think that's right. There's something in the air that hasn't been around, bad and good. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the 60s. There was a lot of bad producing that movement, too. I went to the Women's March in D.C. That was fun. Real fun. Yeah. It wasn't a march. It was like a stand all day. <laughs> I mean, so big. But, yeah, and so did my daughter and so did my granddaughter. So wow. all the generations mm -hmm. are feeling that energy if they can figure out where to be plugged in. And there's a lot of places. So... so the time may be right. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for taking well, time you while you're so here much in for Atlanta. Taking the time to listen to all that stuff. No, this is fantastic. <laughs> this fills in a lot and just oh, good. just a fascinating life. Oh, that's nice to hear. I wish you I could well, it'll be fun to hear other people's because mm -hmm. that'll fill in a lot too. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can collectively Maybe we can Listen collectively to, watch them. Yeah. Are there any that are embarrassing? That's so subjective. I know. <laughs> I wouldn't have been embarrassed by any of them. But I'm sure people, yeah, yeah. There are things that some people say that might... Embarrass others or themselves. It's okay if it embarrasses yeah, yeah, yourself. Yeah, probably a bit of both. Well, good. Well, thank you again. I'll, I'll turn this off. Oh, please do.